being a gangster is not a title. It's the core fabric in which your existence relies upon. Being a gangster isn't a choice. It's something you're destined to be. Being a gangster is a frame of mind where honor and loyalty above all else. You see nothing, hear nothing, and you keep your mouth shut. That's what being a gangster is. And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. To Mob Talk Radio, I'm your host Jeff Canorsi, and we've got an interesting show today, uh, a big show too. Uh, we're going to talk about John Gambino, and I don't think a lot of people have ever really covered him the way that we're going to today. I don't think people realize how wealthy he was. I don't think people realize how much money he brought into the Gambino crime family. Uh, and of course, you know, with that comes the Cherry Hill Gambinos, but we're not going to get too much into the Cherry Hill Gambinos because that's a show in and of itself. Uh, And what I wanted to do was just cover who John was, what he was able to attain, uh, because this guy was making some legit, some legit fucking money. Uh, And he was in the mob for a long time, long time. He's very powerful. A lot of people, I don't think, understand the type of power he wielded. uh, And I think a lot of you are going to be surprised just by how vast, uh, I don't want to say empire, that's kind of probably the wrong word, uh, but by how powerful he actually was. Uh, especially for a guy who really doesn't become a captain until like 80, I want to say late 86 after Paul Castellano gets killed. Uh, you know, Gotti obviously elevates him as captain uh, of Tommy Bellotti's old crew. And that's sort of where, uh, you know, if I had to loosely say it, he was powerful before then. I, I think adding a title to his name, you know, while it helped in, in many different instances, I think his power uh, he had that kind of power before he was even a captain. So we're going to talk about that. We're also going to do uh, a big Q&A. All right, so there really isn't a whole lot of news and notes this week. Uh, but the one thing I did want to get to is I wanted to talk about what we are doing here on Mob Talk Radio going past, say, next week. Uh, if you are on Instagram, uh, you'll notice that we've changed the name to Mob Talk Radio Show if you're over on Facebook, you'll notice we changed everything over to Mob Talk Radio Show instead of Mob Talk Radio. Uh, the new platform is done. Uh, I've already tested the email functions on it and everything because sometimes when you, when you jump to a new platform, you have to make sure all the bells and whistles are working. And in this case, they are. Uh, we are ready to launch. Uh, as of yesterday, I did not truly have a date picked out in mind. Uh, And I talk to a a lot of my listeners who are consistently in touch with me, people that are friends more than listeners than anything. Uh, I talk to them about what they think I should do, what what their opinion was. And I think the general consensus is going to be this. Uh, Next week, we are going to do a humongous Q&A, probably the longest Q&A we've ever done. And then we're going to take a week off and then we're going to launch the platform. Uh, For those that are looking for information, what I can tell you is this about the platform. Uh, with the platform, you're going to get four shows a week. You are going to get uh, giveaways, prize giveaways, which we're going to do. Uh, it's basically going to be the same show. Uh, there's going to be interviews with some high profile people that uh, I don't think a lot of people suspect I'm going to do, but we are going to do that. Uh, and this has been sort of a, a work in progress the last year. Uh, I debated for a long time making the jump for a lot of different reasons, uh, but now is the time to do it. Uh, And for anybody that's coming here that is looking for, uh, you know, uh, more details, then you're you're probably not going to get them here and now. And there's a reason why I'm doing that. Uh, I think next week on the Q&A, I'm going to break down everything, excuse me, everything that this new platform is going to be. You will find out next week. Now, if people decide that they would just rather 
uh, sit on YouTube, then, then you're entitled to do that. But I need to make a change. I need to change up how we do a lot of things. The show is always going to be the same. I, I'm not going to change a whole lot in terms of how I do the show. Uh, I am going to start doing something where I'm going to let people who listen to the show come on the show. Uh, and I'm not sure I, I, we're almost going to do like a lottery effect, I think, with this. And what we're going to do is uh, we'll send out a feeler and then we'll pick like the 50th person that responds and we'll get their number and we'll put them on the show where they can ask questions and stuff like that or do a one on one with me, whatever they want to do, uh, because the show really does not function uh, without all of you. Uh, and there have been people that have stuck in with this show for, for four and a half years now, and, and I appreciate it. There are, there are those that have donated to the show that didn't have to do it. Uh, and, and so past this, one of the questions I wanted to address was why I don't do a Patreon account. The reason why I don't do that is because of the subject material that I do. There are prerequisites to be on that website that you cannot glorify violence, you cannot talk about threats, and so therefore my show cannot be on that platform uh, because what will in invariably fucking happen is some jerk off who doesn't like me will, re you know, fucking turn in the account and then it's just going to create so much of a headache. And, and, and the jerk offs love this kind of stuff. So I'm not even going to give them the availability to do that. Uh, what I also am going to be able to do on this new. So that's why I'm not on uh, Patreon. OK. And anybody that is on Patreon isn't going to be there very long if they're covering the mob. It's just it's against their terms of service and it's just how they op operate. And that's fine. Uh, now, as far as this new site and what I am going to be able to do is you will be able to go on, download it onto any podcast platform that you like to listen to. Uh, so the only difference here, folks, is going to be you're not going to be able to get it on YouTube. There also is a sort of security feature that is installed in this where you can't share passwords with people uh, and share my show anywhere. Uh, I'm going to be the only one that's going to be able to share the show, and I wanted to be able to control where it's put out and what's done with it. So uh, for anybody that, that seems to think they're going to double down and do fake passwords and fake email addresses, well, good luck because there's going to be software installed that's not going to allow it, and anybody that does do that is going to be thrown off the site. Uh, and that's just the reality of it. Uh, I've been dealing with a lot of nonsense for years with this, so now I have the upper hand, and that's just what I'm going to do. It's just to keep uh, people out of this. Now, also on this site, there is going to be an interactive question thing. Uh, and what I mean by that is it's going to be set up within the site itself where you can ask questions right there. So if you're a member of the site or whatever the case may be and you want to drop questions, you can. Uh, and so next week, we are going to get into more of this. I'm going to give you the details from A to Z. I'm going to tell you everything that's going on, what to expect, when to expect it. But I think at this point, what we are going to do is we're going to do a huge Q&A next week, probably a two hour Q&A, which is going to probably infuriate a lot of people. But that, that is what it is. Uh, and then we're going to take a week off and then we're going to launch. And during that week between launching uh, between the next show and the launching, I will be posting crap everywhere. Uh, the blog is going to stay the same. That's not going to change. Not much is going to change in terms of how we operate and how we do the show. Uh, we're just going to have a lot of guests on. We're going to have a lot more fan interaction. We're going to do giveaways. We've got T-shirts that are being designed as we speak. Uh, we're going to do some art giveaway. Uh, so if you're a fan of the Joey Merlino art or any of the other stuff that we do, we are going to be giving away a lot of free stuff. Uh, like I said, T-shirts, stickers, all kinds of garbage. Uh, not garbage, but you get the point. Uh, because we want to give back to people that have uh, hung in with the show. Uh, and so that's where we're going. Uh, also, I think with the, the platform, the site, a lot of people can't take my work and, and do what they want with it. Uh, there's been a lot of people, and it's not just one. I, I think everybody is, is sort of accountable, even, even me in, in the sense of, you know, in this genre, you, you always sort of, I don't piggyback off anybody. I, I do my own stuff, but there's a lot of people that do piggyback and they'll steal what you say. They'll manipulate your words. And so I'm finally going to have the ability to create, you know, my own content and control my own content. And that's what I've always wanted to do. Now, as far as all the old shows, those will be on YouTube. Those aren't going to go ever anywhere. Uh, a lot of the old shows that we've done, we're going to revamp, redo. We're going to release the Detroit show. We've got a bunch of stuff coming. Uh, so all that being said, that is what's going on. So I would expect... Uh, you know, mid October, 14, 16 days out, we will launch the new uh, platform. But like I said, tune in next week and you will get the A to Z on exactly what we are going to do. Uh, past that, 
uh, you know, I've enjoyed being on YouTube a lot, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, it just comes a point where when you work hard on something, you know, you want to own it, you want to creatively control it with YouTube, you really can't do it. Uh, and, and so the, it, the time has come for me to change. Uh, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions from a lot of you guys about this now that, you know, you want to know now, but I'm not ready to do it yet. I just want to wait till next week. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think what we do here is better than what 95% of anybody else is doing. I think this is the most accurate stuff you're going to get. Uh, and, and that's just, that's my opinion. You can disagree with me if you want. So, uh, all that being said, we are going to take a break. And when we come back, we are going to get to the Q and a followed by John Gambino, uh, and if you want more details on what the new platform is going to be exactly with, you know, all the trimmings and everything, then you're going to have to tune in next week uh, to that show. So stand by on Mob Talk Radio. I'm out of town a lot. Uh, whether it's Philadelphia, it's New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, wherever the case may be, I'm always looking for a place where I can sit down and have a great dinner. Uh, ambiance is key. Price is obviously key. But the most important thing is, is the food Good. And there's a place I want to tell you about today. It's called Saltwater at Margate. Uh, if you are going down to the shore, because I know a lot of people in Philadelphia go to the shore, uh, especially Margate, you're missing out on a great restaurant if you haven't been there. Uh, the name is Saltwater Margate. It's at 9401 Ventnor Avenue, Margate City, New Jersey. Uh, the phone number there is 609-289-8078. You can also visit them online at saltwatermargate.com. This place is unbelievable. Not only is the food absolutely superb, the price is great, too. Uh, they're renowned for their pizza and their gnocchi. Uh, they have all kinds of different things from mussels to roast pork and Italian fare. So do yourself a favor. Do me a favor. Go and visit Saltwater Margate. You will not be disappointed. Uh, it is a place that I think at some point, if not already, there's going to be lines out the door and around the block. So if you're down on the shore, stop in, go to Saltwater Margate, at least check them out online at saltwatermargate.com. I know at times we like to have a lot of fun on this show, but it's time to get serious about one thing. I know that the coronavirus pandemic has hurt a lot of my listeners and their businesses. Restaurants have been ordered to close, gyms have been ordered to close, cigar lounges have been ordered to close, and even bars have been ordered to close. These are small businesses that don't always have the cash reserves to continue making their rent or mortgage payments. They can't even pay their vendors. My good friend Mike Kaysen of Kaysen & Kaysen is an experienced bankruptcy lawyer that is there to help you right now. Kaysen & Kaysen represents individuals and small businesses in complex bankruptcy proceedings in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, and Miami. Give Mike a call at 646-397-6226. And if you mention Mob Talk Radio, he's going to give you a free consultation. Once again, it's Mike Kaysen of Kaysen & Kaysen, 646-397-6226. Welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to get to the Q&A. And uh, per the Q&A, uh, if I don't get to your question, it's largely because I've probably answered it before or it's just way too in-depth for me to spend 15 minutes uh, sort of explaining. So uh, a lot of people have asked, and I repeat it as usual at the top of every show, if you want to submit a question, you need to go over to Facebook, type in Mob Talk Radio Show. And you will see a post invariably put out Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday of every week, sometimes Thursday, just depending. Uh, it'll say Q and A and go, and that's where you do it. Uh, you know, past all that, that's that's really all I can say about it. Uh, moving forward, we will still continue to to have the the show page on Facebook, and you still will be able to uh, post your questions there as well as on the new site. So, all that being said, let's get right to it. We got a lot to get through today. All right. Question one. I'm from Philadelphia and I agree with your stance on Philadelphia being very organized and an intelligent group. My question isn't really a question, but sort of more of a statement. Uh, the mob has been here since the 1900s and still here. 
given all the incarnations, uh, do you think it's still a safe thing to say that next to Angelo Bruno, Joey Merlino is the best or most successful boss Philadelphia has ever seen? I know people don't like Joey Merlino, but even the haters have to admit a guy that 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 is that crafty and capable uh, and those around him also are as well. And they're still there. He's had what a 25 plus year run. Uh, so where does his family go in 10 years? I don't think much is going to change. I think that, and, and we're going to get into a little bit of this today about counter surveillance and stuff like that, because there was a question revolving around that. Uh, you know, everything in life evol- uh, evolves, right? So just because uh, surveillance techniques and technology has fucking changed doesn't mean they're going to get, they're not going to get craftier and smarter about how they do things. Uh, I think as far as the, the pertaining to your question anyway, uh, I think, listen, anybody that has a run for 20 plus years is got some intelligence. Uh, there's a lot of people that had four year runs, five year runs, and then they're done. Uh, I think if you can do, you know, it, I think if the bulk of your time on the streets is more than the time you've spent in the can, uh, then I think you're a success. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to differ with my opinion, and that's just my opinion. I don't think I'm comparing the guy to fucking Vito Genovese or anybody else. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, the capability and intelligence of, of gangsters in general, uh, regardless of whether they're a boss or a boss consigliere or whatever, uh, there's something to be said for that. Uh, as far as Philadelphia, the one thing you have to take stock of is that in thir- the last 30 years, if you really break it down, uh, and you break it up to factions, you look at Nicky Scarfo, you look at John Stampa, how many from the Merlino side of things, other than maybe a handful of two or three guys, have gotten huge sentences. Nobody really has. I mean, some people may say a 14-year sentence is huge, and it is. It's not, it's, not, it's not a small amount of time. But the idea is you go in for, say, 14 years, 9 years, 10 years, and you remain in control. You come out, you're still in control. There's some moxie to that. And I think the one thing about Philadelphia that's different than any other place in the world, uh, and, and people are going to disagree with me on this, is that it's very old school how things operate, how things go. Uh, they don't sort of get the respect they deserve, I feel. Uh, and I don't say that because I'm a fan or whatever. Or I know somebody that that's not the point I'm trying to make. The reason why I say that is because they they have not been able to dismantle the fucking hierarchy. If you dismantle the hierarchy, how many times have we seen Gambino indictments? 36 people. Or Genovese, 26 people. Or Bonanno, 50 people. Or or some of the cases where we see 200 people fucking arrested. You're not seeing that in Philadelphia, and there's no reason for it. It's, it's, it's I don't want to say it's because they're smarter. Uh, because I don't want to, like, indemnify fucking other people saying they're not bright. I, I just think that there's an argument to be had of when, when you're in a smaller area. And there, listen, New York City, there's a million rackets. There's a million things you can do. Uh, in Philadelphia, it's not like that. It's smaller. But the fact that the FBI and the government has not been able to take the top five away for for life says a lot about either the FBI's inability to convict, which we could talk about, or the fact that these guys are a little more street savvy uh, than other people. And sure, there is an argument people can make. Well, you know, the Gambinos have fucking 150 guys. It, it's much easier to, to arrest a bunch of them because there's more people to watch. Uh, you can argue two and four, you know, good and bad for that, pro and con. Uh, but I really think at the end of the day, the difference being uh, is that these guys are smart. They're very smart. A lot of people don't give people credit for being as crafty and smart as they are. It's not impossible to convict somebody. It's not impossible to get an indictment. But... And saying that also, I want to say how many in that regime have become rats? Zero. Zero. Go to Stanford, lots of rat problems. Bruno, rat problems. I mean, so when I talk about it and I tell you that it's like a Kevlar vest around people that have grown up together on the playground since they were five, six, seven years old, they've got a longevity and a friendship there that supersedes a lot of the friendships that are here in New York. And so I think at the end of the day, when when you have that bond with somebody, they're going to be less apt to fucking rat. And in and, and Philadelphia doesn't have a rat problem. They did. I'm not going to lie. I mean, we could riddle off the fucking the, the Scarfo era rats, uh, Nikki DeCrow and Tommy Del Giorno and those kind of guys and John Vesey and Ron Previty. Fat fuck. 
I love doing that. Ron Previty. Uh, but I think in general, I think that they're smarter than people give them credit for. I mean, how hard would it be to watch 50, 60 guys? I think it would be a lot easier to watch 60 guys than it would be 150. You know, and, and guys in, in Philadelphia aren't, they're, they're, they're made of something different. They're not going to rat on each other. And that's the reality of it. So, you know, when you look at it in terms of where do they go in 10 years, I don't think much is going to change. You know, of course, we keep hearing, oh, an indictment's coming any fucking day now. They're all going to go to the can, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's going to be the case. The only way that the feds are ever going to get anything on them is murder charges. That's it. You know, your racketeering, your fucking extortion, you know, drugs, drugs and murder are the two big ones. Uh, if the feds could get a drug case, a, and we're not talking about nickel and diamond fucking coke or whatever the fuck, it's got to be something big. Like humongous meth, fucking fentanyl, all that kind of shit that, that uh, you know, is out there now. That is uh, like the prescription drug shit. That's going to be the shit that, that starts the problems or a murder charge because they always try to connect the dots from this one to that one to the third on, on murder charges. Those are the only things, and they're not going to get the murder shit. They're not going to get it because they're not going to get anybody from the top that's going to talk. So I think the longevity, they're just going to keep going. Just ride the train. Keep going north. You know, don't, don't ever turn left, turn right. Just keep going straight ahead. Keep doing your thing. I also think they're very careful about who they let around, too. And I think they're very careful about who comes into the family and who doesn't. I think they've learned from their predecessors uh, what to do and what not to do. Uh, and, yeah, I know people are going to say, well, Ron Previty, you know, was, was around Joey and them guys. And look what happened. Well, look what happened. Nothing. Who went away to who went away to life in prison for that? Nobody. Uh, Ron Previty was another one, a fail witness, a jerk off, a scumbag, and nobody trusted him either. Uh, you know, and so that's the reality of it. I, I think unless you catch a big time murder charge, then then that's gonna be the only way they do it. But you gotta connect A, B, C, and D. You just can't have A and go, okay, now we got an indictment. It just doesn't work like that. So I think at the end of the day, they're just gonna keep moving forward. Why wouldn't they? Uh, but uh, short of a, dr a huge drug charge. Or murder, forget it. Uh, they're not going to, what, what, and we see, especially when you take the Merlino case in and of itself. Uh, they wanted the medical cream fraud and all of this, and we've talked about this a lot, and I don't want to like get down a rabbit trail because there's a lot of questions I got to get to. But at the end of the day, they wanted to throw Joey in the camp for 30 fucking years for this medical fraud shit. And what did they get? 18 fucking months, whatever the fuck, for fucking gambling? When gambling's pretty much legal everywhere, if that, if that's the only thing you can get a guy on, then it's a win-win, and that tells you that the government doesn't have information because if they're going to go off information from a guy who's not credible and all they can get is a fucking gambling pinch, then I would tell you that the scales are, are a little bit tilted. And I'm also going to say this for the record, too, because it's something that I'm seeing in a lot of mob cases in general is the jury is no longer buying what rats have to say in the grand scheme of things. Now, I don't want to talk about the Stephen Crea case because that's a little bit different. It's a little bit bigger and, and that, that involved, you know, murder charges and stuff. Uh, but the informants, the quiet, I, I really don't want to fucking say the quality of informants because none of them have any qualities I'd like to, to even fucking get to know for a second. They ought to be on the business end of a fucking shark or a business end of a fucking knife. You know, that's the way I see things. But uh, in, in terms of just this overall thing, the American jury system is starting to see that the government is flawed. They're starting to see that there's a problem. They're starting to see that these informants really aren't as truthful as the government would like you to believe. Uh, and, and especially, specifically in his case, if you have tapes that indemnify the fucking, the, the rat and make him look like a piece of pile of shit, fucking vomit, jerk off fuck that he is. If you can bring them tapes into a jury and they hear what a disgusting, revolting, wart ridden motherfucker they are then all of a sudden that case begins to teeter, that case begins to fall. And then, then attorneys can start to chip away at the fucking foundation and blow it out the water, and then the guy walks. That's the way it should be. But that's the problem with the jury system is that it's, it's tilted from the very beginning for the feds. Uh, I've said it before. I'll say it again. If they cannot fucking convict you, they get a mistrial, they can fucking bleed you dry. Take all your fucking money, take everything you own, and just keep going at you. Because if they can't put you in fucking prison for the rest of your fucking life or turn you into a scumbag, vile fucking rat, then they're going to take everything you own. Uh, is it wrong? Yeah, it absolutely is wrong. You know, uh, But those are the laws. That's how it works. But like I will always fucking say, knock on wood is that 
if you're going to have evidence that gets submitted into a case and they can bring somebody's past in court as sort of a character assassination against them, then why can't the defense use fucking tapes against an informant? How is that not relevant to the case? Because it makes the guy look like a piece of fucking shit. And the government and, and the judge overseeing the case isn't going to isn't going to fucking bend over to do the defense any fucking not going to do them any help. And so until you get the domino effect where it's drugs or murder and multiple people, you're never going to get nothing. Even wiretaps. I mean, think about how stupid wiretaps are. They can wiretap a guy. He's allegedly saying this, that and the third. Then they have to bring in a fucking rat to dissect what they're talking about like listen i'm not a mobster i'm not any of that but if i can listen to tapes and i can kind of know which direction they're going what the fuck does the fbi need a rat to talk about it for like he's a fucking interpreter in the the lower half of the fucking screen doing sign language and shit it just doesn't make any sense to me but uh, i don't think much is going to change in philly i really don't i i think it's just i think as they move forward uh, in the next 10 years, I, I just think they're going to get more secretive, more low key. They're pretty low key now. So I don't think much is going to change. And, and I think that the people that talk about Joey in terms of, oh, he's not a smart guy. He's not this. I think Joey's a smart guy. And, and I, I don't say that uh, for any other reason than, than watch. Watch with your own eyes. What do they get him on? What do they get him on? Gambling? Come on. You know, that's a that's a bullshit charge. It's like a fucking uh, what do you call it? A, a fucking jaywalking charge as far as organized crime goes. So until they get something like a murder or drugs, forget it. It, it. That goes for every family. But the problem is when there's more of you, there's more eyes on you. Uh, and, and like I said, and, and I don't know if the, the organized crime task forces are going to change or if they're going to change how they do do shit. But guys are getting smart. Uh, this is why we're not seeing, you know, you go to the 80s, like indictment after indictment after indictment, uh, early 90s, indictment, indictment, indictment. Now you're you're seeing it still, but not to the extent that it once was. And Philadelphia hasn't had a huge case since the 90s anyway. So there you go. Uh, all right. All right. What's the one piece of advice a mobster is giving you that sticks with you to this day? Um, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, th there's somebody I know that says, keep your head up, keep your eyes forward, ignore the words out of fucking nitwits, uh, make your money, keep moving forward. Uh, you know, be a gentleman, handle yourself like a gentleman until there is nothing left to do but not be a gentleman. And if you don't know what that means, it's simply saying always be respectful to people. Always treat them with respect until there's no respect left. And then you handle your business like a man. And that's that goes in all facets, facets of life. It ain't just the streets. It's, it's every facet. Uh, if somebody's want to be a shit talker, let them shit. Let them talk shit. You know, you tell them, look, I don't appreciate it. Whatever the fuck they have an understanding. You don't like it. They continue to do it. Well, you got to do what you got to do. Um, my grandfather always said loose lips sink ships. I didn't know what that meant when I was a little kid. As an adult, I definitely know what that means. Uh, you know, I would sit at uh, his kitchen table uh, for breakfast or whatever. He'd bring me fucking donkeys. Uh, if you're from the Northeast, you know what donkeys is. And, uh, you know, he'd get me fucking a box of 20 chocolate fucking donuts, which I could barely eat two anyway. But, you know, he liked to do that. But he would always say, loose lips sink ships. And he would tell me that nine or ten times a fucking day. Uh, you know, and now I know it means don't fucking open your mouth. Don't say nothing. Don't see nothing. You don't hear nothing. Uh, something my father always used to tell me, uh, and, and, and I've heard it in multiple different forms or ways, uh, is that never let the mouth of irrelevancy shake your tree. Uh, and, and what that sort of means to me is don't let somebody who's irrelevant in your life, who has nothing but a mouth, even deter you from what you're trying to do. Uh, and so I always kind of, you know, my father wasn't a gangster, obviously, but I, I just, that is a very gangster type of thing to say. Uh, but yeah, guys, I learn a lot from a lot of guys. I don't want to say old timers because then that puts like a fucking age on them. Uh, but uh, when I mean old timers, I, I mean guys that have been in the life, you know, 30 fucking years. They're smart uh, and they guide you in a way uh, so that you understand. Uh, it doesn't take rocket science to, to, to hear a guy give you advice and read between the lines. You know, uh, they're very good for advice. They know a lot of things. A lot of these guys that, that I've met in my life. Fortune 500 company owners, they could have done anything. They just particularly do this, and that's what they're good at. Uh, but, you know, like I said, those, those are kind of some of the things that, that, that I've heard growing up, and some of these are just recently. Uh, all right, so all that being said, let's go to the next one. 
Uh, I know you have some stalkers and haters, and my question is, why do you think they waste so much time saying ludicrous shit and then all of the things that are said, what's the one thing that gets you going like Canarsie does? Um, you know, people say a lot of things, and I think initially, first of all, you, you got to have, you got to realize the source of the information, right? So if it's somebody you know and somebody you care about, then yeah, that could be hurtful and, and, and agitating and make you angry. Uh, but I think that if you begin to listen to what every pinhead has to say and you take it to, to fucking truth, then you got a problem with yourself uh, because it shouldn't bother you unless it's true. Right. So I think with me, if there was if there was truly anything that really got under my fucking skin and, and when I say get under my skin, I simply just fucking mean that it that aggravates me is when people tell me that I'm hiding from somebody, uh, you know, who who the fuck am I hiding from? Uh, you know, they, people seem to think I hide under a fucking bridge. Like I don't have problems like that. Uh, and the people that say these things, you know, are the keyboard warriors and they're not going to say it to me and they're probably not going to say it to anybody. These are the kids that got the shit beat out of them every day on the fucking playground and ran and told on them to the principal or they went home and ran to mommy instead of just fucking dealing with it. Uh, that's the types they are and everybody wants to act tough, but when it comes time to be tough. They, they, they just can't. And I'm not trying to play the tough guy. Not at all. Uh, I think people that do know me will tell you I'm not somebody who's going to take any shit. It uh, doesn't mean I could beat everybody up in the fucking world. I mean, I'm 43 years old. I don't think I could do 12 rounds no more uh, or ever, really. But I, I think at the end of the day, like the, the fact they think I have to hide from people, it, it just it's stupid. Uh, you know, they'll say things like, uh, you know, he doesn't know anybody, he's a nobody. Uh, and, and, and if that's the case, then what the fuck would I need to hide from? <laughs> I mean, in, in reality, like, do people really think about what they say? He's got to hide from this one. What do I got to hide? If I don't know anybody and I'm delusional and crazy, like everybody wants to fucking say, then what am I hiding from? My fucking shadow? Like, get the fuck out of here. Casper, the friendly fucking ghost with a, a dildo or something. Hey, well, what am I hiding from? Nothing. Uh, you know, listen, at the end of the day, I just call a spade a spade, and that's not for everybody. Uh, Howard Stern had the same kind of problems. Uh, so do people dislike me? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and I think the mistake that I think people make with me uh, is that the people that do know me, you know, outside of the radio show, like a normal sitting at a, a, a social club, having a coffee, playing cards, is that I'm relatively quiet. I'm not like this, you know, I talk and bust balls and all of that kind of nonsense. Uh, but it, it, it's not what they want me to be. Like, they want me to be some sort of fucking animal that's running the fucking streets with a straitjacket screaming mafia, mafia, mafia. That's really not how I sort of carry myself. And anybody that truly knows me will tell you that that's not the case. Uh, you know, and, and, and to use common sense here, if I was reckless with my mouth, right? then who the fuck would come around me to begin with? Nobody. So, you know, listen, everybody has their own opinion, and they're justified in that, I suppose. Uh, they have that right. Uh, but the ones that spin the machine, they're soft. They've always been soft. It takes no courage to attack somebody's family. It takes no courage to attack somebody's friends. So either I'm relevant or I'm not. You can't be both. So oftentimes, you know, they'll make wild claims, which aren't true, and they try to make re uh, irrelevant. In, in all facets of organized crime, but then two seconds later, they make me relevant without even realizing it. So which one is it? You know, look, at the end of the day, I'm just me. That's the bottom fucking line. Uh, you, you think, you really think at the at the end of the day, I'd be able to say some of the stuff that I say uh, without some of the support of friends? You know, nobody does what I do, and this is not an, an ego-driven statement. Nobody does what I do. I'm the first person in the history of this game that defends them, uh, supports them, whereas everybody else, you know, you know, name calls and says, oh, they're guilty without even looking at the facts. The reporters do this kind of nonsense. Uh, name me one other person, and I'm going to wait for the rest of my life for this, this fucking answer. Name me one other person that has done what I've done. Name me one person, and that comes with hatred because people just don't like it because, you know, they want to be me. And in the, that's going to sound atrocious for me to say, but they want to be able to do what I do. And nobody's stopping them. Nobody is stopping them from not doing what they want to attain in life.
the fact that I'm doing it, getting successful doing it, that that burns people. They just don't like it. And because I don't share the same fucking opinion or because they have wet dreams about walking down the street in a fucking silk suit going, yeah, yeah, your mother, and running into gangsters, that's what they want. But the reality is they meet one of these guys, they're going to shit themselves. Because personality aside, even having mutual you know, common interests like football, baseball, hockey, basketball, whatever the fuck it may be, that's only going to get you so far. That's going to get you two steps on the cement. But if people can't trust you and if, if people can't see that you're streetwise and, and you know what's going on, then they don't got to worry. So I want somebody to tell me one fucking person that does what I do. Who attacks the rats? Nobody. Me. You know, it, 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 listen, it comes with hatred and I understand it. But, you know, I don't honestly, I don't give a fuck because at the end of the day, let them talk and let them hear themselves because that's what they truly want. Because at the end of the day, it goes back to like childhood. You remember when you liked the girl in class, you kind of picked on her a little bit, right? Because you want a response because you want her to like you. So you want that fucking response. That's all these people want. Half the fucking people that don't like me, I kicked off of my site because they repeatedly kept asking me stupid questions about a fucking rat in New Jersey. And I'm just not going to indulge myself with it. And so because I, I'm just not going to answer it, one, because I legally can't and everybody knows that. But more importantly, my life has moved past that. That's three years ago. Let's, let's try to fucking move on a little bit. But because I won't indulge them, they get mad. Oh, he's a dick. He's this. See, I knew everything was right. And then they start the troll machine. That's how it works. But I don't give a fuck. Because at the end of the day, uh, when, when the fucking dawn of time ends, you'll still hear my voice. Nobody's going to remember who the fuck you were. And that's just the reality. A hundred years from now, my voice will still play somewhere. Nobody will remember what the fuck you did. Because all you've accomplished in your fucking life is try to take down people that are more successful than you because you have no fucking intestinal fortitude to make your life better. I don't give a fuck if people don't like me. But I, but I will tell you this. And it's somebody that doesn't like me that confronts me about it. I got more respect for them than the fuckers that hide behind a fucking keyboard. That's all I'm going to say. All right. Uh, I recently saw some idiot on your page keep asking how you can morally hang out with people who may or may not have committed horrible crimes and someone he was someone he was trying to wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me let me try to decipher this one. Uh, I recently saw some idiot on your page keep asking how you can morally hang out with people who may or may not have committed horrible crimes. Uh, and he was also trying to say that because of what they did, somehow that makes you more scrupulous. That's a big, that's a college word there. Uh, I know you haven't answered this question, but I think you should. Will you? Uh, I I know the idiot you're talking about. I saw it repeatedly. It was asked like every three seconds. And then because I didn't answer it publicly, it became a, oh, see, he's hiding from this. First of all, let me explain something to you. What anybody has done prior to me meeting them, knowing them, becoming friends with them, going to a bar mitzvah, wedding, funeral, whatever the fuck the case may be, I really don't give a fuck. Because first of all, uh, that whose assertion is that that they've done something horrible? The government? Listen, a lot of people do horrible shit. You know how many people you walk past in a single fucking day that rape people, fucking uh, diddle kids, fucking uh, do horrible shit, and you don't know that. You know, it's one thing if your friend, if if you meet somebody, you don't know nothing about them, you find out they're a pedophile. Well, then that that's a different story. Then I get it. Uh, but what anybody does is their fucking business and not mine. How does that make me more scrupulous? Because like I can I can have a general fucking friendship with somebody that has nothing to do with their career, nothing to do with what's in their closet or what they got going on. That would be like somebody meeting me and going, ah, he's got felonies. We can't get around him. That makes me a moral piece of shit because he did something stupid 25 years ago. So the at the end of this, so you don't know somebody that, that you're friends with that did something dumb. So that should somehow indemnify your fucking character. That should make you a fucking scumbag, good garbage pail and all that other stuff. So at the end of the day, do I, am I friends with, with people that have murdered people? Maybe. I don't know. Do I give a fuck? No, I don't. Because as far as I'm concerned, how I live my life, how they live their life are two different things. You know, I, I'm not going to, I, I constantly have this thing on this show where I get the morality question with me. Oh, how could you support anybody that kills anybody? Very fucking easily. Very fucking easily. Uh, and I'll, I'll play the scenario like this. 
Uh, we'll just use a guy named John because I, or Bobby. Let's use Bobby. So Bobby joins the mafia. Bobby kills somebody to join to get in to to get his fucking button. Then years later, then years later, Bobby gets whacked. Okay, so why do we give Bobby a pass on killing somebody else and then crucify the motherfucker that kills Bobby? They only kill each other. Last time I checked, the mob wasn't walking down the street with signs blowing people's fucking head off for the pleasure of it. So from my perspective, they do whatever they got to do. The ends justify the means. Uh, and, and I, you know, listen, I would be lying if I told you that at some point in my life, I didn't consider murdering multiple people. I think it's a human fucking feeling and a human fucking emotion to want to kill somebody at some point. You mean to tell me you've never sat there at your desk at your little office, nine to five or whatever, thinking if that motherfucker looks at me sideways again, I'm going to put my fucking pencil through his fucking eye socket, then piss on his corpse. You've never had a thought of hurting somebody. That's normal. That's ingrained in fucking human beings. It's in your DNA. The, the fucking caveman club people to death. That gene is inside of you. So you, you can't, so don't play the morality game with me uh, and all this kind of shit. And the person that asks is probably a guy that gets drunk and beats on his wife. You know, so at the end of the day, don't, don't, don't come with me to, with the morality questions because at the end of the day, I don't give a fuck. That whatever anybody does has no effect on who I am. Now, if I'm heading out, uh, if I'm hanging out with child molesters and pedophiles and all that kind of shit, then by all means, I fully expect that. So, but then this is the same fucking idiot, the same idiot that kept publicly posting, where can I go in New York to see a real gangster? Where can I go in Philly to see a real gangster? And I just, I'm not going to, stupid, I'm not going to answer that. So this is the same asshole that has delusions that he wants to meet a gangster and then he's going to fucking try to chip at me because I may or may not know people that might have at some point hurt somebody. Fuck out of here. Fucking idiots. That's why I don't answer questions like that. Uh, so hopefully that that puts that to bed. Uh, but I'm not going to judge anybody. I'm not here to judge nobody. I don't care what anybody's done b before I met them. That's just that's just how I roll. And that's none of my business to begin with. And it, it isn't. And it never will be my business. All right. Obviously, with what you do, it comes with certain politics. Uh, I notice you're careful at times with the things that you say, and you do clear up a lot of the lies that people spread consistently. And my question is, what is it like to deal with all of that? Are there moments that you're afraid? Uh, I don't mean any disrespect by that part of the question. I just think that what you do is honorable, but I know it's got to come at a stress level that probably isn't normal. Uh, sometimes, yeah, no, I, I'll admit that. Uh, fear, I, you know, I don't think fear really comes into play for me. Uh, I think that you could be jostled or you could be jolted a little bit. I've been jolted before. I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, it, it's not. I, first of all, I, I think I should be clear. I don't fear any man because at the worst case, what are they going to do? They kill you. All right. Let's say somebody kills you. You're not going to have no choice in the matter anyway. So why waste time fearing someone? I, I, you know, listen, does that mean that these guys are, aren't to be feared? No, they are. They, they are to be feared. But I've often found if you just respect people and you're honest and you're upfront with them, then you're never going to have a problem. You lie to them, that's a different story. Uh, and yeah, what I do comes with a lot of politics. It's it's and, and there's no real defining way that I can verbalize to you what that's like. Uh, sometimes, listen, sometimes you got to tell somebody something that, that you know they don't want to hear. Sometimes you got to give them bad news. And you know that doing that it's going to make things a little dicey. And when I mean dicey, it just means somebody's going to get agitated because they don't want to deal with the nonsense. But at the end of the day, that nonsense is important because it's a problem for them or it could be a problem that's rooting its head. And, and you, you got to cut, cut the head off the fucking snake to kill it. Uh, and I don't enjoy doing stuff like that. And I don't enjoy putting myself in a situation to be considered the guy that comes with bad news. Nobody wants to be that guy. I've never liked being the messenger of bad news. If, if, if I could find a way to do it without having to do it and somebody else could do it, I would do it every day like that. Uh, but I also have to subconsciously make a fucking decision when I know, first of all, there's, there's two things that I do. One, I hear a lot of nonsense. That's number one. Uh, and I always ask myself, okay, does this affect this person? How could this affect this person in a negative way? And so I have to go through down through through this checklist of what I do saying, OK, this is garbage. This is nonsense. I'm not worried about it. But if I get anything that that comes in terms of could this affect somebody a year from now? Could this affect, a, 
more than one person? Could this affect multiple people? Then I have to do something. Then I have to do something. Morally, I have to do something. You can't call yourself a friend of somebody and then fucking bury the bullshit or the information and say, well, you know, I don't know. Because that's that's not how I am. I can't be that way. Uh, sometimes I will delay the information a little bit just because I want to make sure for multiple people that this is actually accurate. Because there's so much bullshit and gossip out there that you, sometimes you have to filter through way through the shit to find out the facts. And then when you do, you kind of bite your tongue, you make a call, and then you say, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I'm sorry. And yeah, sometimes, you know, it could be redirected at the messenger. The messenger always gets shot. That's just the way how it, I'm not saying that's happened to me. I'm just saying, but, but sometimes, you know, uh, you can be, uh, and I don't want to be like the bringer of that information, but if I got to protect somebody, that's what I'm going to do. And if people want to get mad at me for that, then, then, then am I a friend or am I a foe? Because if the role was reversed, and somebody was had a beef with me or the, this, that, and the third. I want them to come to me and tell me. I got to know these things. Uh, somebody once told me, uh, and, and not not to get into specifics, but somebody once came to me and I said, listen, you know, I heard this, that, and the third. And the person just kind of looked at me and said, you know, what the fuck are you just telling me this fucking now or whatever? And I said, well, I didn't want to tell you. And he says, no, Jeff, you have to fucking tell me. You have to tell me these things. So... You know, it, it does come with politics. You got to pick your spots, but you also have to uh, be conscious of everyone involved. You got to be conscious of yourself. You've, and you just have to to really, at the end of the day, wade between the nonsense and what's true. If it's it's, it's not important, I don't waste my fucking time. Uh, but if it is important, believe me, I, I get right down to business because that's what I would expect. And if people want to take fucking issue with me because of that, then that's fine. But aren't I being a friend to somebody for being honest? That's the thing. I'm honest to a fault with my friends. Uh, and even if I say something that I know it's going to upset them, I do it anyway because that's what you're supposed to fucking do. And if that gets too in the back of my head, so fucking be it. You know, I, I can't really, I cannot, uh, you know, force people to act a certain way. All I can do is be a friend, unwavering uh, and very loyal to the end. That's just me. So... Uh, you know, they, they can, uh, you know, it comes with politics. Um, they're not always going to be, people aren't always going to like what you say. Uh, but have I ever been scared? No, no, I've been jolted before a couple of times, but it's just because you know who you're dealing with. You know, they have a reputation. Uh, but like I've always said, if you, uh, and the truth is like the quote I said earlier, if you act like a fucking gentleman with somebody and you're just up front, you say, listen, yeah, I did say that you own it. And then you explain why you did it and you just you you know it's never going to end the ball busting of, of something you said that may have been incorrect but at the end of the day if you own it and act like a man and say yeah you know what i did say it but how can at this point i move forward with you uh to make the situation better and that's what you do and if the person's respectable and a gentleman they're going to get it they're going to let it go doesn't mean it's not going to come up every once in a while because it will but that's just how you treat people you know, because a real man will be like, all right, you know, I understand, but don't do it again. And then you just move on. That's it. That's it. All right. Uh, I don't know if you'll answer this question, but I'm sure in your travels, you have been to some shady places uh, and heard some shady and incriminating and yet, albeit maybe creepy things. My question is, uh, when you are in a situation such as that, how do you react? Do you passively laugh or just ignore it? Uh so, yeah, I, I've been in some situations uh, where I've heard some things. Uh, and what I tend to do really when I hear that, because sometimes I hear shit and I know it's accurate, you know, uh, but I don't I don't subscribe to that. And what I do is I get up and I move 20 feet away from them so I don't have to hear it. Uh, you know, sometimes it's gossipy people. Sometimes it's legitimate guys. Uh, but the one thing I don't do is I don't hear nothing. I don't see nothing. I don't repeat nothing. You know, I might go home and laugh my ass off about it. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, you know, I, I don't, and I don't want to get specific because there's one instance I could talk about, but, uh, let me say it this way. Sometimes when you go to places, there's a lot of gossipy people within the place and there's gangsters there, stuff like that. And you will invariably hear this one killed that one. This one hurt this one. And when you hear that, then you hear a name attached to it, you know, and, and maybe, you know, uh, that it's probably true. You just, you'd get up and move. You don't listen to it. You just don't listen to it because that type of stuff, 
I've always used this reference. If people in a particular place are all talking about the same murder, for example, this is example only, and everybody's putting the same fucking name in a fucking murder, chances are it's probably pretty accurate. But if they're all talking about it and you know the feds are trying to fucking really figure out what's going on or the cops, whatever the case may be, if everybody in this place knows what's going on, then the cops do too. But the only difference is nobody can put X, Y, and Z together to get an indictment and all of this kind of nonsense. So when I'm in a situation where I hear something like this or I hear guys talking about stuff, first of all, unless I'm actively sitting at a fucking table where this is being discussed, it's none of my fucking business. And I forget about it in one ear and out the fucking other. Uh, and, and if something has ever been discussed in front of me, which there, there have been plenty of times that's happened, uh, unless I'm asked my opinion or unless they're engaging me, I don't utter a fucking word because it's not my place to speak. You know, if you're a guest of, of somebody uh, because they like you and they respect you and, and you're loyal to them, unless they look right at you and ask you a fucking question, you don't say a fucking word. You just sit there. That's what you're supposed to do. You don't speak unless they fucking ask you to speak or unless they want your two cents. And most of the time, they don't want your fucking two cents. They're either venting or they're talking about this, that, and the third. You don't say nothing. Me, I'm kind of a prick and I'll come out of left field and be like, so you still Irish line dancing? Or I'll make a joke just to get everybody to laugh to cool the fucking tension. That's what I do. That's the way I've always been. But uh, yeah, I've heard some creepy shit in my life. But it, it's is it real? Is it guys talking shit? Is it ball busting? I don't know. I really don't know. But at the end of the day, I pay. I just, unless I'm at the table having a discussion, if I'm five feet away and they're talking about something, I hear it. I don't retain it. I just keep moving. I don't give a fuck. It's none of my business. If I'm at a table with somebody and they're openly discussing it, unless they fucking look at me like, what do you think, Jeff? I'm not going to say a fucking word. That's not my fucking business. It's not my place. I would much rather walk down to the end of a place, see a guy that I know, and hey, how you doing? Give him a hug. Give him a kiss. How are things? How's life? How's your kids? I would rather have that conversation than to hear, yeah, did you see his fucking eyeball come out of his head when I put two in his fucking throat? That's the kind of shit I don't want to hear. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it is what it is. All right. Uh, a while back, you said that you found out that Russell Buffalino was the one who ordered Sam G and kind of whacked. Uh, what makes you think it was Russell Buffalino for sure? Wouldn't Tony Accardo have some big say in that? Um, so, to, so, so, yes, all of that, all of those things you say are true. Uh, Sam Giancana was the front boss, or at least the acting boss. Uh, the problem was that all the waves that Sam Giancana was making, you know, the mob had a big problem with his upcoming Senate hearing. He had problems with Frank Sinatra, the JFK shit. Uh, Giancana was being seen all over the place at the Cal Naval Lodge. Giancana was supposed to use the underground tunnels to go from one bungalow to the other, but instead he just walks out in the fucking open. Uh, the, the fact that he was having wild orgies with Hollywood actresses, it, it was a big problem for them. Uh, and they needed to draw away from Kennedy, especially after Kennedy dies. And, and the ones mainly involved in that would have been Santo Traficante, uh, Russell Buffalino, Carlos Marcello, uh, Jimmy Hoffa, et cetera, et cetera. They would have been the ones who made that call. Uh, and, and I don't think that that necessarily would have been a normal call either uh, because you're not exactly killing a fucking nobody. Uh, and But I don't think Accardo would have had any disagreement. Was he notified? Absolutely. I think he was. But was that ultimately saying, you know, it's like picking up the way, hey, Tony, you know, this guy's got to go. What do you think? Go ahead. Do it. You know, I, I don't think it went like that. And, and I say that because there was so many different fucking things in play in this. This wasn't just because, you know, Giancana was fucking people. This was because Giancana had been very fucking reckless with a lot of people. Uh, and the three people that if Giancana fucks up the Senate committee hearing wouldn't have necessarily been the outfit. It would have fucked Traficante, Buffalino, Marcelo, and a whole host of other motherfuckers. Uh, and so that's why... I have been a firm believer, and, and I, I have enough, I think. I don't have a, listen, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I, don't, I wasn't there privy to the phone conversation or whatever the case may be. But I really think that Buffalino was the one that said, you know what, this has got to happen. Because Buffalo Buffalino was uh, orchestrating a lot of things. Like, they, they never seemed to mention Russell Buffalino with JFK, but, but it, people don't understand he was very actively involved in Johnny Roselli and a lot of other things. The reason why he does not get that sort of press clipping is because he was so underground with everything that he did. Uh, but would ha would it have been something or Car uh, Tony Accardo had to, to to agree to? No, I don't think he had to agree to it because I think they were going to do it either way. Was he notified? Absolutely, absolutely. 
Uh, but this was much bigger than just a, a sort of crime family internal issue with Giancana. I mean, this was a big, wide issue. And, and I don't think that Buffalino uh, made the decision all on his own either. Uh, I, I'm sure that Carlos Marcello and, and Santos Traficante, you know, had a lot to say about it. And I also think they wanted Giancana dead immediately. And it did help Tony Accardo out. Don't, don't think that, that Giancana going away did not help help out the outfit because it did. Uh, you know, Accardo had a ton of strength, but he did not have the strength that Marcelo Traficante or Buffalino had. That's just, you know, the reality of it. All right. Is the process of becoming made still the same as it was in the past or has it lost its luster? For instance, I'd assume that Greg Scarpa was made. It was most likely it was probably a big deal for all involved. Is it the same today? I would largely. OK, uh, I would assume it is. I mean, I think guys getting their button is something that they aspire to get. Uh, it does it have the fanfare that it, that it fucking had in 1960. I don't know. I would, I, I would think either way that guys that they, they want their button and want to be recognized. It's a good, it's a proud day for them. Uh, do I think that there's all the pageantry that there used to be like say in 1955, 1960? No, no. And, and I think that, that most of the, the, the process of it is probably still the same as it's always been. Uh, probably with some small differences as each family does their own kind of thing. Uh, but I don't think much has. I don't think the process has necessarily changed. I think the the difference is. I think there's, uh, you know, back in the old days, it was you had to whack somebody for the most part. For the most part, you had to kill somebody. And I think now it's sort of become, uh, if you can earn your ass off, that's just as that, that that's sort of a a push cart, uh, you know, green light to get to to get made, uh, because times have changed. Things are different. Listen, if you're willing to, if you're willing and capable to commit murder, that's great. But if you can't, if you can't earn no fucking money, it's like, and I use this like, let's talk about hockey for just one second, right? So, in hockey, you got the NHL, you got the fucking American Hockey League, and then you got the ECHL, and then you got juniors and, and everything else. Uh, the thing is, is everybody that's playing in the ECHL wants to get the NHL. The only way they can get there is the AHL, right? So, uh, it's very rare that a guy goes from the ECHL up to the NHL. But the reality is is that there's steps you have to take today. That, and that would have been in correlation with yesterday's mafia. Today's mafia, you can easily go from the E to the NHL uh, because you can bring money in. Uh, you don't have to prove all these other merits. But, you know, it's different. I think it's also different for every for every family. I think they, they all have prerequisites of what they want. Uh, and, and listen, I'm not privy to that information, so I, I can't give you one 100%. But I don't think anything's really changed. All right. Out of the four bosses who had more pull with the commission, Russell Buffalino, Raymond Patriarca, Santos Traficante, or Angelo Bruno. Uh, Buffalino, uh, you know, probably, to be honest, at the end of the day, uh, the, especially because he made a lot of political moves. Bruno had power, but not really the kind of power anybody else did. He had power within, you know, Philadelphia, but past that, not not a ton. Uh, Ray Patriarca had a ton of fucking power ton of power but not like buffalino buffalino was really the guy who bridged all the fucking malcontent all the disagreements he was the guy you went to 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 sort of have you know, the consigliere of everybody uh, that was the guy you wanted in the room to help settle things uh but none of them had the power that that russell buffalino did all right do you think greg scarpa if he didn't contract aids would if the okay do you think greg scarpa if he didn't contract aids would have been found out to be a rat uh listen and that was a a lot of people have asked that but the truth is a lot of guys on the streets thought he was a rat to begin with uh a lot of people were talking in hushed conversations about you know listen everybody's getting pinched greg's not getting pinched it's a little strange uh but the thing is is that if you even alluded that greg scarpa was a rat he would fucking kill you he would not fucking hesitate to kill you uh so nobody was going to confront him about it uh there was you know but there was definitely a lot of talk about it for sure uh, the problem is you can suspect he is all day long, but if you say anything and he finds out, he's going to fucking kill you. He's going to squeeze your neck till your eyes pop out of your asshole. I mean, that's just the, the fucking reality of who he was. Uh, so imagine, you know, that situation, you're working with the guy, you start to kind of feel maybe he's a rat, but you can't say shit because, like I said, he's going to squeeze your neck till your fucking eyes come out your asshole. Uh, and then you can't ignore Greg on top of it because he's a fucking killer. So guys that maybe had that sort of idea... What could they do? Eh, they couldn't stay away because he's, what are you staying away from me for? What's your problem? So a lot of guys got fucked, cluster fucked in that. Uh, you know, it was a no win for everybody around them, to be honest with you uh, about it. 
but no, I don't. I don't think AIDS. Uh, you know, listen. I think a lot of guys had suspicions, but what are you going to do? All right. I read that Jimmy Coonan dismembered bodies and usually put body parts in garbage bags and threw them into the East River. Uh, Ruby Stein, for example. Um, so Jimmy Coonan knew Roy DeMail really well. I think Coonan got the idea from DeMail. No, I don't. Listen, Jimmy Coonan, uh, you know, uh, well, then again, uh, you know what? You're probably right. You, you're probably I, I don't think that Jimmy Coonan really learned it from Roy. I think that it obviously, you know, Roy DeMail was a butcher by all accounts. Uh, I think that probably Jimmy Coonan probably dismembered somebody before Roy DeMail. Uh, did it help that Roy DeMail was pretty much uh, the, the glowing example of how to dissect the human body? Absolutely. So uh, do I think he learned it from him? No, nah, probably not. Did it help having that friendship and learning more about it? I'm sure. Uh, you know, the, the, the tactic of removing a pain in the ass has been around for a long time, especially when you talk about dismemberment and et cetera. It doesn't take rocket science to fucking like understand how to do that, I suppose. Uh, but, but do I think he learned it completely from him? No, no. But do I think that being around Roy and seeing what he was doing kind of led him to the path of, oh, this is a great way to do it? Probably, uh, probably, uh, it, look, it was the fun method that Roy DeMail liked and used, uh, you know, and, 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 and both of them were known for doing that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't think he necessarily got that trait from Roy, but I think he sort of picked up on the vibe of it and said, ah, let's do it this way. Uh, all right. You've said that the American mafia never kills women or children, but why would they, what, why would they, oh boy, this is worded fucked up. All right. When you say the American mafia never kills women and children, uh, but, Okay, this person's making a reference to Adriana and the Sopranos getting killed uh, or in the Bronx Tale where the young C witnessed Sonny do a murder. Uh, would they wouldn't they would they just take a pinch if a woman or a child would be willing to testify uh, when I'm asking questions? I always refer to the heyday of the mob. Um, so basically, the, the, the crux of the question is, you know, I say that the mafia never kills women and children. Uh, but what would they do? Like uh, you use the situation of the Sopranos when Adriana gets killed by Silvio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so here in the here in the United States, the mafia doesn't kill women or children. It's just a rule. You don't do it. Uh, however, you know, when you take up the Sopranos, it's not Sopranos aren't real. A lot of people think that's real. It's not real. Uh, but given the situation, just to, to sort of parlay your question uh, is that Adriana was riding on a boss. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if there was any other route they could have taken taken with that uh but he would you want to talk reality in the mafia uh what probably would have happened if that situation was real okay christopher would have been killed almost immediately because he would have been responsible for bringing her fucking around doesn't matter that she's the rat and he's not the fact that he brings her around they're going to blame him they're going to kill her probably more than likely but they're really going to kill him uh i don't think that they in a situation like that a boss would hesitate it just depends, but I don't know. She would disappear. That, that would be for sure, but so would have Christopher. He'd have been killed almost immediately. Uh, you know, there is a thing, don't, don't kill the messenger, et cetera, et cetera, but in this certain case, in this instance that we're talking about, uh, you brought him around. He turned out to be a rat. He's going to die. You're going to die. That's the way I think in reality it would have happened. Uh, you know, it, they would have pinned it on him. Uh, and that, listen, there are other ways to get to a witness without having to commit murder. Uh, usually a visit from Joey to wrench or Louie to lip stretcher can get a point across without pulling a trigger. Uh, in Italy, it's totally different. Just ask Toto Rina, who had a 13-year-old kid beheaded. He didn't fuck around. It's totally different over there. Uh, he didn't fuck around whatsoever. And as I always say, you take murder off the table in situations, what are you, you going to fear? A guy's going to beat you up with a bat, break your arm, break your leg, whatever the fucking case may be. You'll recover. Can't recover from two in the head, my friend. All right, are you aware of any friendship or mutual respect, respect between Joey Merlino and Meek Mills? I saw a news clip of Joey come out of court, and one of the things he said to the cameras was, free Meek Mills. Uh, this is when Meek Mills was incarcerated. Do you think they're still friends at all? I don't know if they're really friends. I think they met. You can have a mutual respect for somebody like, hey, I like what you do. Hey, I like who you are. Uh, but I don't think they're sending each other fucking emails. Uh, and besides, I'm going to tell you this, and a lot of people, you know, Meek Mills... You know, for all the nonsense he was talking about, there's some stuff out there that, that shows him talking to a fucking DEA agent. So, 
you know, I don't know the validity of it. I just know there's a lot of stuff out there about him. Uh, something to do with a record producer who was testifying for the fucking DEA. He was involved with the production company or the music company, which, and he knew that she had testified for the DEA. So by proxy, a rat is friends with a rat. And that's just sort of how it goes. I'm not saying Meek Mills is a rat whatsoever. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that there's information out there that people are putting out that he directly was working with a production company or a music company where one of the founders or the people that formed the company had testified, uh, you know, for the DEA to put somebody in prison. And so the, the assertion that's being made is he knew it. Why is he doing that? I don't know. It has nothing to do with me. You can look that up on your own. But I think as far as, I don't think it's really a friendship. I just think it's a mutual respect thing. That's all. All right. How tired are you of getting some of the same questions on your show? Uh, it's not the people's fault, but I listen to every one of your shows. And at this point, well, Jesus Christ, uh, you know, do you do this show with a bottle of Tylenol next to the mic? Uh, yeah, look, sometimes the questions do get old. Uh, but I listen, I can't expect everybody who who asks questions to know. I mean, you would have to fucking go back and listen to every single fucking q and I've ever fucking done and be like, oh, he asked this. Oh, he asked that. Okay, I can't ask this. People don't know. Uh, and, and so I listen, I try to, even though like I've gotten probably the same question a thousand times already, I try to answer it as best I can. Uh, the Gotti shit gets old. It's beyond old to me. It's vomit inducing to me. Uh, and, and that's why I won't even answer those questions anymore because it, it's not, it's not a knock on anybody. It's just how many fucking times can I talk about Paul Castellano getting killed and the reasons why, how many fucking times can I talk about Gotti's wiretaps or this, that it just gets old. The guy was, the guy was a boss for like four and a half years. You know, it's, he's not, he's, he wasn't Angelo Bruno. He, he wasn't fucking, uh, he, he wasn't uh, fucking Vito Genovese. He wasn't fucking Vinny the Chin. There's big differences between those people. And, and, and that's the other thing that, that sort of mitigates why I don't even go down that road anymore. Because if you say anything negative, they jump down your fucking throat because people cannot. They only want to acknowledge money, crime, infamy, fame, pussy, cars, houses. That's all they want to talk about. You know? They don't want to talk about the negative aspects, and, and that's what I try to do. I try to give you some positive shit, and I try to give you the negative shit, and I always let you fucking decide what the truth is. Nothing wrong with liking John Gotti if that's what you want to do, but in reality, in the grand scheme of things, he was no fucking Frank Costello. He was no Vinny the Chin. He was no fucking uh, Tommy Lucchese. He was no t Carlo Gambino. He was uh, not even Tony Ducks, as far as I'm concerned. There's positive and negative aspects that come with everything. Uh, and yes, there are certain attributes to, to John Gotti that, that, that I like senior. I'm not talking about the other one, uh, <laughs> but there's also negative stuff too. Just like with me, there's positive things about me that people like, and then there's things people fucking hate about me. It's just reality. You're not, nobody's fucking perfect. Uh, if he had a 20 year run, would my opinion be different? Absolutely. Uh, if he didn't get caught on wiretaps, would, would, would my, would my opinion be different? Sure. Absolutely. It's just the reality. Listen, history is always going to remember the guy. He's always going to get press clippings. Uh, he had panache. He had charisma. I don't think any, he was dangerous. I don't think anybody's going to say anything different. But, you know, if you're going to do a biography, or you're going to talk about somebody. Let's talk about both sides of the coin. And I'll do that with anybody. It's not just one person. You know, that, that's just uh, to be fair, to be fair, to be fair, to be fair. And that's that, I suppose. All right. Uh, do we have any updates on Anthony Comello? Is it safe to say we haven't seen anything like this before, meaning no trial, no news? Uh, if it didn't involve an alleged mob boss and family, would uh, would we be demanding justice? Seems like uh, the family is silent. We are 18 months into this thing and it seems like nothing is happening. Thank you. And I enjoy your show. Uh, I believe the trial got a new date. Uh, but with COVID, everything, you know, is backlogged and fucked up, and that's just everywhere. Uh, I don't know whether the delay helps him or hurts him, uh, but once, listen, once he gets into gen general population, if that ever happens, it's over. Uh, I don't think he's ever going to experience gen pop. He's going to be in PC the rest of his life. That's just the reality of it. Uh, I don't know how he's logically even going to be found to be legally insane because what he did took planning. Uh, and while I think what he did was revolting, you know, I have to admit, a part of me was like, wow, you know, look at the planning that that involved. The way he did it was professional. It wasn't it wasn't just like some random. OK, this is a good idea. Let's just do it. Uh, the, the kid was a little bit smart on his end of things. 
Uh, but look, look, this isn't the first time that Anthony Comello stalked a young girl either. It's not the first time he's done this. The, he stalked the Cavalcante mob guy's daughter for like months. Uh, so apparently he, I guess, has a sort of mob fixation, so to speak, with girls or daughters or nieces of, of the mafia. Uh, but I but I think you'll you'll see it move forward. But the the, the sanity plea is not going to work for me, uh, but it'll eventually get going again. All right. Why is Drita's husband, Lee, not black blacklisted like Renee's dad? Is it money or or is it money or was he never associated with a rat or is he just a true G, a gangster? Uh, to my knowledge, Lee's not even a made guy. Uh, you know, he's a fringe guy. And I think if you look at his recent arrest, you know, it shows how desperate people can get sometimes for money. You know, uh, Lee's related to Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani. I hate that fucking name. I hate him. Uh, he is related to Rudy Giuliani. They actually are cousins. Uh, look, I don't judge the guy. You know, a pinch is a pinch. But, you know, I, I sort of feel bad. There's a part of me that feels bad for Drita. I'll be honest with you. And I'm not castigating fucking Lee Diavanzo. I'm just not doing it. Uh, but I feel bad for her. I feel bad for the kids uh, because they're the real victims of it. Uh, but, you know, you live that life and that's the price you're going to pay. Uh, you know, get smarter, get the fuck out. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Uh, you know, is is he a hardcore gangster? No. Is he a dangerous guy? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I listen, I, I know a little bit about the case. I, I You know, it's a shitty thing. I think the guy got like five years or something like that. Uh, at some point. You, you got to come to some sort of reconciliation that you're not good at what you're doing if you keep getting caught. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sure there was somebody in there that dropped the dime and told on him. And, and that's just the reality of it. But, he, but you know, why why would you blacklist a guy? He was probably making people money, uh, you know, but at some point, you know, there's a big difference between Anthony Graziano and fucking Lee Diavanzo. Big difference in stature, big difference in who they were. Uh, but to my knowledge, he's not a made guy. Uh, if he is, uh, then, excuse me, if he is, you know, it, it's just a pinch. It's just a pinch. Uh, you know, it, it, listen, the guy was trying to make money, do whatever he needed to do, uh, and he got caught. Uh, it, it's a shame. It's a shame for, for his kids. Uh, it's a shame for Trita, but but that's life. I and mean, you want to play the game, be prepared to take the time. Uh, but I tell you one thing, the guys stand up. He don't talk. Uh, so, you know, you can't ever put that label on him. Uh, all right. Uh, how does the mob get to jurors when trying to nobble the jury? Uh, surely names are kept under wraps. How can they be sure that they won't go to the judge if approached? Uh, they can't be sure. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it's a risk you got to take to get your point across. Uh, sometimes they have, you know, like bad cops uh, who can get information for you. Or they'll have a car follow somebody, or they'll know somebody in the, the clerk of the court's office that can give them information. It's, that, it's more simple than you would think. Uh, and look, yeah, they take risk knowing that a, a juror could rat on them, could squeal. Uh, but usually when there is a lot of money on top or a threat of violence to bend them like a pretzel, they're going to give in. That's how easy it is. That's how easy it is. All right. Uh, how? Okay. This is going to be a long answer to this. Uh, okay. So what and how would you consider the classic mob prototype psychologically speaking? Uh, is the personality a born predator and a master manipulator uh, a la the chin and Carlo Gambino, a combination of canny chess player, low key yet lethal if necessary like Buffalino, or a composite mixture of all of those traits that allow them to survive so long? Uh, the qualities you so continually cite, street-savvy, murderous mentality, uh, steely determination, and to do whatever's needed for expansion, not extinction. We anxiously await your answer as an authoritative answer. Uh, go. Uh, so you have many types. Uh, you've got guys like Carlo Gambino who are quiet, they're unassuming, they're highly bright, uh, they stay low-key at all cost. Uh, he, you know, he doesn't have the trappings of other things. He's comfortable at the top with a small house, a normal car. Uh, living his days like somebody that would live built to bill. Uh, then you have a guy like Gotti who spent everything he ever had, bought every expensive thing he could get, and then couldn't keep his mouth shut because his ego was more important than the longevity. And that's reality. People don't talk about that a lot. That's not to take away from him being a tough guy or whatever, but that's reality. Then you'll have a guy like Tommy Patera uh, who would cut your fucking head off if you ever fucked him over. Yet around children, he's an angel. He treated women. Well, with all exceptions to Phyllis Birdie, uh, with respect and warmth. Uh, Roy DeMeo did some really disturbing shit by, by all accounts. 
He was a good guy to be around other people's kids, including his own. Uh, the ones that are best suited to that life are guys like Carlo Gambino and Tommy Patera. If you can be all of those things, you can be murderous if you need to be, concise when you need to be, authoritative when you need to be, those are the guys that are going to succeed in that life. You can't just be a Tommy Patera. You can't just take the, the, the strand out of Tommy Patera that was a guy who would kill somebody and just that's his only thing that he does. Uh, if Tommy Patera couldn't earn money and all he did was kill people left and right, your longevity only goes but so far. The guys that are successful can do it all. Uh, I've always said in that life, you've got to be an earner or a murderer, and if you can do both, then you're valuable to them. Maybe not these days so much, uh, because I think more of the emphasis today uh, is is on the, the, the idea of being able to make money. Uh, if they can keep it low-key, they don't need the fucking Ferrari, but in a moment will kill you without a second thought. Those are the guys that are going to be uh, have some longevity. But killing a lot of ton of people is just going to bring heat. So you gotta, you gotta, you can't just be one-dimensional. Uh, what I also can say is anybody that I may or may have not met who may or may not allegedly have killed people, they don't talk about it. And I think to them, it's just like going to work. It's one of those things uh, that they do out of a necessity. I don't think with few exceptions, uh, guys, you know, get up in the morning with their coffee and go, you know what? I just want to kill a prick today. I I just, it it doesn't work like that. Uh, But I do think that there are those who will tell you straight up that they're not afraid to do it. And if they're provoked in a certain kind of way or fucked over in a certain kind of way, that's what they're going to do. So I, I'll give you a scenario. Imagine the kid who gets bullied his whole life, doesn't fight back because he's taught not to. You know, turn, turn, turn your head, to turn the other cheek, that kind of shit. That kid grows up, joins the mafia. Now he's got respect. And you think that, that doesn't come with aggression? You'd be crazy. Uh, then they can pull the trigger without any indifference to life because that is the thing that I call the anger molecule. Uh, not that I'm a fucking psychotherapist, uh, but you know what you, you see this enough times with serial killers, and I'm not comparing the two, but you see it with them. They all seem to grow up the same way and have the same problems. Uh, I have the same anger molecule that a lot of these guys do, uh, especially when I was younger. Uh, but believe me, you know, I, I had a judge at like 13 years old look at me and tell me, prepare for a life in prison because I was what he called indiscriminately violent without repose or empathy, which means I didn't give a fuck. Um, and whatever the fuck that means, indiscriminately violent without repose or empathy. Uh, you know, and, and listen, not to even go into details, uh, but, I, but I'll give you sort of a, you know, I, I've got to be careful how I say this because this is, this is something that can create a little bit of havoc, but, uh, let, let me, let me, let me just try to say it. I'm trying to figure out how to say this without, mm, okay, let me give you an example. How about that? So, uh, you know, you have to be able to carp, carp, uh, grr. you have to be able to, to compartmentalize things that you do in that life. And when we're talking about gangsters, they, carp, uh, they, they sort of put everything in different drawers. Look at a chest. I'm going to make it very simple. Look at a chest, like a hope chest, a fucking dress, a drawer, whatever the fuck you have to be able to like, okay, there's the politics of this. There's money for that. There's this over here, this over here, murders down here. You can't keep them all in the same drawer. You got to put it in different places. Okay. And so for guys and, and if anybody is listening to my show, it's God forbid ever murdered anybody. They're going to know what I'm talking about right now. Uh, when you commit an outrageous act of violence, such as murder, uh, there's something that happens uh, chemically with, with inside of you. Uh, and, and, and mm. oh boy. Okay. So, so who, whoever has been in a similar situation is going to understand what I'm about to say. You, when you commit a murder, your, your adrenaline goes out of control beyond out of control. It's like drinking a hundred coffees at once. Then for some strange reason, the human condition, and I'll never understand how this operates, you go on autopilot. There's no thought process. You run on autopilot. Uh, And it doesn't end for days. It's not like you you whack somebody and the next day you're like, ah, coffee and nothing – when, when something like this happens, you go on autopilot for days. Your, your body can do, totally takes over. There's no fear. There's no worry. There's nothing. It's just sort of like a cloud. It, it's very hard to, to sort of describe. But the difference is, you know, days or months later, you know, thoughts come back and, and, and stuff like this. But you learn to put it in the drawer. 
you and, and that's the point I'm trying to get to is you learn to take it from you know your your uh, I'm, I'm trying to the, the audibly the sounds of it the fucking visual of it you learn to put it in a drawer that you don't fucking touch that collects dust and that's that's sort of what I'm trying to explain in my own way. Um, I, I know for me, uh, there's a lot of things in my life I've been able to put in different drawers, and you have to. And, and I know it sounds psychotic and all of that, but that's the closest thing I can sort of describe as how you would, uh, you know, compartmentalize things, the seedier parts of things. Um, you know, I know for me, uh, you know, at a young age, I learned how to, with my, with my anger especially, uh, at least the outward signs of it, I learned to close off. Like, you know, like my father said to me when I was a kid, I was like a bottle rocket going off. If you fucking infuriated me, boom, I would just pop. There was no sizzle of the fucking wick. I just went fucking off and I just went crazy immediately. But as you grow up, you learn how to do different things. And, and so at 43, I'm more composed and, and it, I'm more like a rattlesnake. Uh, you hear the rattle go off. But you don't know where it's coming from. You don't know when it's when I'm going to bite. It, so you learn how to just not show anger in a certain kind of way. And I know this is like a weird rabbit trail that people are going to be like, Jesus Christ, does he kill people? That's that's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, I'm just trying to explain to you how somebody that lives that lifestyle has to put things in different drawers to not deal with shit. Uh, you know. You don't have to be the toughest guy in the room. You don't have to be the toughest guy in the block. But you got to be the one who is going to fight to the death if you have to, to preserve your reputation. Uh, and you have to be willing to go where nobody else is going to go without hesitation. It's one thing for a motherfucker to bark. He's going to stab you. It's another for a motherfucker not to say a word and just do it. Uh, so in terms of the streets and in terms of what we're actually talking about, uh, it benefits you more to be low key. Uh, it benefits you more not to show anger. It benefits you more to just be quiet. I, I think, you know, listen, if you've got to be violent, you, you know, if you've got to be violent, you got to be able to show violence. You can't talk violence. You just got to do it. Uh, if you appear soft or you appear weak, uh, you know, that's a bad thing. But the street shit is about perspective and reputation. It always has been. Uh, so, uh, if you could be, say, say Tommy, or if you could be Carlo Gambino, Tommy Patera, a little bit Vinny the Chin in terms of making the right decisions at the right time, it's going to serve you well. Uh, but for everyone, for every one of them, there's an Anthony Center, there's a Roy DeMeo, there's a Gas Pipe Castle, there's a Greg Scarpa. And they enjoyed killing. They liked doing it. There is a big difference. So while I understand on a certain level, uh, to me, that's just a bit too much. Um, so... Uh, Gordon, I apologize if I didn't answer it exactly the way you wanted to. Uh, you're you're one of my favorite fans on this uh, radio thing that I do, uh, but I can only talk about myself and I can only talk about what I think that's like, uh, you know. And, and unless you've had a hundred coffees in one single shot and you go on autopilot, then you have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. And there will be people that listen to the show that do know what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to leave it at that. All right, do you think today's mobsters in general are of lower quality than their historical counterparts? For example, if a mobster from today was dropped into, into the year and conditions of the 1930s to the 70s, would they be as successful as their counterparts, or would they prove to be a watered-down version of the past? Uh, I, think, I think some would fail miserably. I also think some would succeed. Remember, today's FBI tactics and surveillance is totally different than it was in the old days. While sure, you know, every generation you evolve a bit, uh, sometimes you cannot out evolve technology, uh, but that's, you know, but but is the quality different or are the times different? Well, let, so let me ask you this. I'm going to ask a question. Could Carlo Gambino have survived post 86 through 1992 uh, without, you know, with, with the with the technology of surveillance? And I don't think he could have. I just don't think he could have. You know, would, he would have gotten caught in some way, some shape, some form, one way or the other. Uh, I can name three or four guys that I know who, if they were thrust back in the 1930s to the 1970s, would have been superstars in the mafia. Forget about it. Uh, I can name some from the 80s who would have probably gotten whacked months in for the way that they've acted. Uh, so in a way, yeah, things have changed. Uh, ways have changed. Technology's definitely changed. But a gangster is still a gangster. And any gangster worth his grain of salt just keeps moving forward and does not look back. All right, why is Phil Leonetti so afraid to go back to Philadelphia if he's had so much surgery done to him that he looks un unrecognizable? Is it just him being there that he fears or him probably getting recognized? 
Uh, I don't think he's had a ton of surgery, to believe it or not. I, you know, I think he looks relatively probably the same without the raccoon wig that he wears. Uh, a guy like Leonetti cannot walk down the streets of South Philadelphia. He'd get his shit wrecked in 10 seconds. That's the reality of it. Guys have long memories there, uh, and you can get whatever fucking surgery you want. A rat still has a stench that can be smelled miles away. It's just the reality of it. Plus, you know, he walked and stood like a whale, you know, uh, Phil Leonetti had a walk. He had a certain type of walk, and that's very identifiable. So you can get all the plastic surgery you want, but if you walk and you stand on the corner like a whale parked a dick in your ass, you're going to be identifiable immediately. And that's how he walked, and that's how he stood, like a whale parked a dick in his ass. That's the reality. All right. How did the concrete? Uh, how did the concrete club really work? And were the Gambinos mainly in control of that racket, or was it all five families in the Gambinos having the most cut of that racket? It was all the five. It was all the families, uh, but the Gambinos and the Genovese crime family were pretty much at the top of that pyramid. Uh, and it was it was a design really by the Gambino crime family. It, it was a lot simpler than people think. Uh, you know, they control the unions, which is everything. Uh, if you control the unions, you control the workers, you control the prices, you control the delivery, X, Y, and Z. Uh, they control the city zoning permits in, uh, you know, when you control the permits, you can control what gets built, where, who, what, when, and where. Uh, also, when you control all of that, you control who gets concrete from who. Everything from the bottom to the top of the building uh, was controlled. Uh, once they control the union and the zoning, then they control the workflow. They assign no-show jobs. They bring mob control contractors. Everything from wiring, concrete, to rebar, asbestos, they control every inch of it. And then they split the profits with the other families. Uh, and the biggest aspect of that was probably bid rigging. Uh, the mob owned companies who would, you know, rig the fucking bids. Uh, and it was a really a complete, it was a marvel to, to, to sort of see how they, they did it. Uh, and it just really completed a, sort of a monopoly uh, in, in every sense of the word. Uh, they those those guys made billions. I mean, billions. All right. How does a small seed of an idea become a mighty tree? I don't know, but you might want to keep a, an eye on Mob Talk Radio to find out. Uh I, I think I know where you're going with this. And the only way I can really uh, sort of say anything is it's not the strength of the branches of the tree or the amount of sunlight, rain, love, or nurturing that you give a tree. The root of the tree has to be strong. Never forget that. Without a strong root, there is no tree. So there you go. All right. Uh, who do you think would have been the underboss of the consigliere if Tommy Bellotti took the reins of the Gambinos? And I'm sorry about this John Gotti question. I know you don't like him, but do you think Tommy would dif- dissolve... Gotti's crew. Fantastic job. Can we get a Ron Previty ordering food from McDonald's? Oh, jeez. Fuck. I didn't prepare for that. Uh, I'll take a fucking Big Mac. Because uh, uh, I'm Ron Previty. I want fries. Uh, I can fit five Big Macs in my mouth and fries and, and, and you know, do a blowjob with a hero in my mouth. So, Ron Previty. There you go. Uh, I don't think Tommy Bellotti would have reigned too long. I, I'm just being honest. I still think at the end of the day, there you know, there were others besides John Gotti who wanted to climb the ladder and take over the throne. Had Bellotti taken over, uh, I couldn't tell you who he would have picked. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I was, what, eight years old when, when the hit goes down on Castellano. But logically, I think, you know, he probably would have picked a Castellano supporter, probably somebody older. But then again, maybe Joe N. Gallo. I don't know. It, it would have it would have depended, uh, you know, even if Bellotti had gotten, gotten the nod. Just because Castellano dies doesn't necessarily mean that Tommy Bellotti would have gotten the to, to become the uh, the boss of the family. Uh, you know, uh, I just think being just just being Paul Castellano's driver wasn't going to be enough. Uh, but Tommy Bellotti was a crazy guy. He was a tough guy. He was an earner. Uh, but the sharks would have been circling like crazy, and I, I still think he would have had some somewhat of a war. All right, what is the most coveted position, boss, underboss, or consigliere? Um, I understand the underboss has more power and prestige and makes more money, but it's also a bigger target on the guy's back for law enforcement. The consigliere tends to be less in the open while still carrying a lot of weight. Uh, I, I think it depends on the person, to be, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, consigliere does have power, but but he's not the boss, right? So his job is to advise, to give his opinion, to clear up problems, uh, whereas an underboss has more power. He directly carries out the boss's fucking orders to the to the underlings. That's just how it works, uh, and he can carry out actions. Coveted to me would be the underboss, in my opinion. The safer of the two would probably be the consigliere, uh, but it also depends because I've met uh, consigliere's in my life who carried a ton of weight, 
uh, especially in the old days, like especially in Providence. Uh, but it, but it's really more about personality than anything. Uh, I, I, you know, I've seen bosses be soft and nice, uh, and I've seen the consigliere be a fucking animal, uh, and the reverse of that. So I think it just depends. Um, how much do you think Carlo Gambino and Neil Delacroce were making a year as boss and underboss? Uh, Gambino probably well over two hundred million dollars a year. Delacroce probably two to three million dollars a year. Keep in mind inflation and time period, but I can't be exact. Uh. Let's see. Uh, I know you covered Jimmy Burke already, but would you do a full show on the Lufthansa heist? Absolutely, that is coming. Did the mob have anything to do with the death of the singer Sam Cooke? No, absolutely not. Uh, all right, during the Winter Hill Gang area, uh, how powerful were they compared to any mob family along the East Coast? Most documentaries definitely put them on the same level. Uh, from about 1955 till about 1972, they were. Uh, once Whitey Bulger took over, they mainly were able to just control Boston, uh, and that's really about it. I mean, outside of Boston, forget about it. I mean, a lot of what Whitey Bulger had uh, was built on violence, uh, and anytime people know that you're going to butcher them, you're going to kill them, uh, they're not going to stand in your way whatsoever. The Winter Hill Gang was tough, especially in the old days, and, and the one mistake that I think people you know, have made in, historically was being greedy. Whitey Bulger was greedy. Uh, instead, you know, even if you go back to the early days of the Winter Hill Gang, you know, instead of playing well in the sandbox with, with other people they fought, imagine if the McLaughlin Gang had just not gone to war with the Winter Hill Gang. Uh, and what's sort of funny is Alex Rocco, and in case you don't know who I'm talking about, uh, he was the actor who played Mo Green in The Godfather. He was a big actor in Hollywood. Uh, you know, his real name was Alex Petricone. Uh, and he started the entire war between between the McLaughlin Gang and the Winter Hill Gang. Uh, and how that all sort of gets started was there was a party and Georgie McLaughlin hit on Alex Rocco's girlfriend. And as a result, Alex and some others about beat McLaughlin to fucking death. And then the McLaughlin gang, uh, you know, demanded Alex Rocco's head on a platter. They refused. And that's when the shooting begins. And as the shooting begins, uh, Alex uh, Petricone changes his name to Alex Rocco, takes off and flies to California and becomes an actor. Had the, su had the two sides just sat at a table and divided everything up. Uh, you know, that would have been something to see. Uh, but a lot of these groups back in those days just didn't do it. And I get it. And I understand why. All right. Uh, let me see where we're at in this show. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we are going to continue with your Q&A. Stay tuned on Mob Talk Radio. <laughs> to mob talk radio i told you we were going to do some fucking q a questions we're here in an hour and a half already and uh we're gonna get through about 10 more take another break and wrap it up with john gambino all right any any info you can give us on umberto valente the guy who tried killing joe to boss masseria ah the ghost that was his nickname the ghost uh not a ton is known about him however he does arrive in new york about 1910 from sicily and he ends up settling down like right on the lower east side of manhattan which is where i live actually uh, he ends up going to work what would 
what would become the Diakilo crime family and was directly under Salvatore Diakilo, who at the time was a captain uh, in the mafia. Uh, the one thing Umberto was good at was murder. And in a relatively short period of time, uh, Diakilo realizes that Valenti was very skilled at his position and very skilled at his trade. And Valenti's first murder on the record was that of Fortunato Lamonte, uh, who was a powerful captain in Harlem. Uh, you know, he was a thorn in Diakilo's side uh, and Valenti took care of it without a problem prior to prohibition. Uh, they find out that Valenti was skimming money from one of the Achilles rackets and he ends up getting marked for death. So he flees back to Sicily, he comes back a couple of years later. I believe it was in 1922. And then he attempts to regain stature and friendship in the mob by killing Vincent Terranova, who at the time was one of Salvatore de Achilles biggest problems. Uh, in two days, Valenti killed Vincent Terranova, Terranova's underboss, uh, the Silva Tagliagamba. Uh, and then a day later, he tried to, to hit Mar uh, Masseria. Uh, he ends up getting into a gun battle with Masseria and his bodyguards. The two sides, you know, fire shots and they end up, you know, shooting four guys and two women that were just innocent bystanders. But he, you know, they 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 did not uh, end up killing each other. Uh, then on August 9th of, I believe, 19, I want to say 1922, I, yeah, 1922, uh, Valente tries to kill Masseria again as Masseria is walking out of his 80th 2nd Street Avenue apartment. Uh, he gets rushed by two armed men who open fire on him. Masseria ducks into a store at 82 2nd Avenue uh, with uh, Valente and a partner uh, sort of in pursuit. Uh, they shoot out the front window. Uh, and sort of shot up the uh, entire, uh, they end up shooting up the inside of a store. The gunman then, uh, Valente is who I'm talking about, then flees across 2nd Avenue to a getaway car, which was idling just around the corner on East 5th Street. Uh, the car was actually a Hudson Cruiser, believe it or not, and the gunman jumps on the running boards as the, the car begins to speed west on East 5th Street towards the Bowery, guns blazing like a drive-by shooting. Uh, the gunman then plowed through a crowd and shot randomly at the blockade, and they end up wounding six people. Mar Mar Masseria would survive that incident, too, uh, and would be found upstairs in his bedroom sort of freaking out about the whole fucking thing. Uh, you know, uh, two days later after that, Lucky Luciano ends the problem. Uh, and what I mean by that is Luciano was dispatched by Joe Morello to end the Valente's life. Uh, Valente was called to a meeting in Brooklyn, which he attended. As he goes in, he realizes he was outnumbered and sort of begins to feel his life's a bit in danger. Uh, in the middle of a conversation, he pulls out a piece and begins blasting all over the cafe. He bursts out the door into the street. He made his way to a taxi, but the problem was like Luciano was lurking in a nearby alleyway, steps out, pop, 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 and that ends Valente's life. So there you go. All right, do mob families, uh, do existing mob families or crews still use the publicly visible social clubs, i.e. the Ravenite or those a bygone era? Now, the social clubs are still around. Uh, you know, there, there aren't as many as there used to be. Uh, I go to two myself, and I can tell you that, that each borough, you know, still has one floating around. Uh, some guys even have gotten a little bit smarter than that, uh, and they use houses now with a back entrance that you can't see off the front of the street. But no, they're still there. Uh it's it's not like it was in the 1980s, but they're still there. Uh, I've noticed families would use the Profaci Columbos as hitmen uh, to do work. Why is that? Ah, they were good at what they did. I mean, it's really as basic as that. They were good at what they did. All right. In a post 9-11 world, how much resources do the, does the government truly dedicate to investigating investigating La Cosa Nostra? And does it does scaling back permit some families to expand or flourish? Uh, I look, I still think that they put money there, but it's it's not what it was. I, um, you, you know, uh, the, the feds are more interested in terrorism right now and other things at this point. But the one difference that I do see is the quality, if, if you want to call it that, uh, of informants. Like I said earlier, it, it's it's getting more and more disgusting. Uh, put money aside for a second. Let's look at, you know, reality. The government can have whatever fucking tapes they want, but without somebody to interpret what the fuck is being said, like I said earlier, the feds are fucked. So for me, they, they can have all the wiretaps, all the photos, whatever the fuck they want. Uh, they can spend a million dollars to put a camera in a tick's dick for all I fucking care. Uh, but none of it's, you know, put together without the rats. So I think it's very apparent, at least these days, uh, at how lowbrow the feds are going to go and how far they're going to get with guys like fucking... Philip Leonetti, fucking J.R. Douchebag Rubio, and fuck finger Lou Monticello, that fucking cretin. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. But I think the quality and standards, if there ever were fucking any, are, are, have gone out the window. 
Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think that they're putting nearly as much money into it. And I think guys have gotten smarter. Uh, so there you go. All right. Do guys in the streets get to choose, choose which family they want to join or is it just whatever affiliation and ties they fall under? Uh, it's usually who you meet. Uh, if you meet a guy, you get along well, you make money together. There's a, a, you know, a natural progression there. I, I don't think anybody sets out to be at a Gambino at 10 years old. Uh, you know, I, I just I think it matters who you bond with more than anything. There have been times that guys start with one family and end up in another. Look at Sammy DeBull Gravano. I mean, he started with the Columbos, ends up with the Gambinos. Uh, you know, imagine if he never leaves the Columbos. Imagine how that would have might have changed fucking history. All right, Jeff, when did the word capital regime stop getting used in the mob and what would happen if an associate robbed a capo back in the day day or current day? Well, first of all, if you rob a captain, you're going to get killed. That's the bottom line. I don't think it matters if it's 1962, 92, 2002, 2022, whatever the fuck. You rob a captain, you're going to get fucking killed. Uh, do people still use capital regime? I'm sure in some instances they do. I just I think it just depends on, the, you know, I just think it depends uh, on the person using the word. Capital is a lot easier to say than the capital regime and, you know, all of this stuff. But, uh, you know, listen, and if an associate robs a captain and, and a captain finds out you robbed him, uh, they're going to need a new dentist. They're going to need an orthopedic surgeon or six of his friends are going to carry him by the fucking handles, if you know what I mean. So there you go. Uh, do you think uh, do you expect anything dramatic to pop off out of Montreal, Toronto, Hamilton soon? It, listen, it's going to depend on what the Rizzuto crime family does. It's going to depend on what Andrangheta does. Uh, it's going to depend on whether uh, Andrangheta can begin to move left to right, so to speak. You know, I would expect that it's going to probably die down for a little while while, you know, the, the hit on Musitano was, was a long time coming. It got a lot of press, got a lot of attention. Uh, and what people, you know, people got what they finally wanted uh, out of getting rid of Musitano. But it's it's going to be a jockeying time period where guys are going to jockey for position. And I think it'll be relatively quiet uh, because, to be honest with you, I don't, what is left of the Musitanos after this? Uh, they had problems on the streets to begin with, and, and so it's going to be quiet as long as nobody jockeys for that position too uh, aggressively. If you jockey for a position very, very aggressively, like if somebody in the Musitano says, okay, I'm fucking taking over, and Dragon is going to step up and kill them too. That's just, they're jockeying over turf, they're jockeying over old retribu uh, retributions, um, and so I don't know if the Musitano crime family at this point is, is going to rally its troops or they're going to get absorbed. It just Canada's the wild fucking West. It's totally hard to predicate, totally hard to fucking dissect, totally hard to to give you a an accurate sort of uh, psychic, <laughs> if you want to call it that idea or feeling about what's going to happen. Uh, I think it's going to be quiet for a while and then it, it, it'll ramp up again. It'll ramp up again. But a lot of it's going to depend on who's going to try to take over. Uh, you know, there you go. All right. Best restaurant on Federal Hill. Uh, probably going to be in Dino's. Uh, but my personal favorite's Camille's. Uh, growing up, Camille's is where you went. Uh, so for my money, I'm going to say Camille's. But you know, if you want something quick to pick up and take home, go to Caserta's. Uh, you know, that was always a staple. Uh, the best deli ever in Providence, uh, near Federal Hill, was Anthony's Bus Stop. When I was a kid, they would take me in there. Anthony would be hiding the counter. And what I loved about Anthony's was, you know, he had the pepperonis hanging and all this stuff. And he was old school. He used the fucking the, the paper wrap, not the plastic bullshit you get from your fucking Walmart or wherever the fuck. He used the paper wrap and he would take a pencil and he would write the price uh, in pencil. That's old school way of doing shit. Uh, and when my mother would take me into Anthony's, who go, oh, Jeff, how you doing this, that, and the third? And he's like, Jeff, you want some pepperoni? And my mother would order whatever cold cuts that we were going to get. Uh, and, uh, you know, like people, people say deli meat. It's fucking cold cuts. That's what it is. It's cold cuts. I don't know why people call it deli meat or sandwich meat. It's fucking cold cuts. Uh, and I would stand there and, and Anthony, we you know, we'd cut the pepperoni for my mother, the cheese, whatever we was getting. And, uh. You know, he'd, he'd whisper, hey, hey, come here. And I'd go over there and he'd hand me the biggest fucking chunk of pepperoni you've ever seen in your life. And of course, being a little kid, I'd fucking eat it. Oh, yeah, this is great. And I would eat it. And then he would cut another piece, like a, the head off the, the, the salami, and he'd hand it to me and I'd eat it. And he would get the biggest shit kick out of me fucking eating that stuff. And, and Anthony was a great guy. Uh, I don't know when he died. Probably, I, I mean, he, Christ, he was like fucking 80 when... When I was fucking eight or nine years old, uh, but he was very generous, very well loved in the neighborhood. 
Uh, when I was actually back in Providence, I think last year, I drove down where uh, Anthony's bus stop used to be, and and it it I I didn't first of all I didn't you know I, I couldn't really find it to be honest with you because everything has changed so much on the hill uh, and around the hill, but uh, Anthony's is no longer there. But those are good memories as a kid, you know, going in, she, she'd order the gobble ghoul and the, and the, the fucking cheese and, and all everything that we were going to eat and take it back to my grandfather's or whatever. But Anthony would always hand me, like, just shuffle my pockets full of meat, you know, and it, those are those are some of the things that I remember about Providence. Uh, but for my money, Camille's or Andino's, take your pick. But Camille's is always sort of, you know. Uh, held a warm spot uh, or Villa Capri. I don't even know if Villa Capri is still open. Villa Capri was good. All right. Last question. Can a person with no mob contacts or excuse me, can a person with no mob connections approach a captain with a money making idea? Hello from Detroit and Windsor, Ontario. Uh, so listen, if you don't know anybody in the mafia, you're not going to walk up to a mob captain and go, Hey, check this out. I can make you some money. It doesn't work like that. You gotta, you gotta know somebody. You gotta be, you gotta be known in the neighborhood. You gotta know contacts. You gotta be able to, to, to sort of be trusted because they're not going to let anybody just off the street, walk in and go, hello, you don't fucking know me, but I want to make monies with you. Cause I heard you're in a mafia. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, it's people you grow up with, or you meet somebody through somebody and, and it takes a long time for trust. These, these guys aren't going to trust you out of the gate. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a friendship you got to nurture and they got to be able to know that you're never going to say nothing. And, and that's how they test you. And, and listen, I think when you know mob guys, they're always testing you always, 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 they're going to tell you something that, that may not be bullshit, maybe half truth to see if it comes back. And if it doesn't come back, then they know you're not going to talk. And, and so, you know, I, I, uh, unless you're, unless you're a multimillion dollar guy and they're going to try to shake you down, they'll be friends with you if they think they can shake you down. That's just the truth. Uh, but if you don't know anybody of that way, if you haven't been from a neighborhood, there's no way anybody's going to talk to you. All right. So all that being said, I did more questions than I was supposed to. Uh, but all that being said, we are going to take a real quick break. Uh, and when we come back, we are going to do the biography on John Gambino. And I think you're going to be very surprised at how powerful and how wealthy this guy was and how capable he was. Fuck capable guy. Stand the fucking guy, too. Stay tuned on Mob Talk Radio. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to be talking about John Gambino. If you don't know who he is, we're going to get all into them details uh, right now. All right, so anybody that is looking for a complete biography on on John Gambino, you're not really going to get the entire thing because then I would have to cover the fucking Jersey, uh, the, the, the fucking Cherry Hill Gambinos. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, uh, but I'm mainly going to talk about, you know, the 1975 to... to uh, the end of his life. Uh, so, uh, John Gambino was born Giovanni John Gambino in Sicily in August twenty uh, second of nineteen forty. The Gambinos, uh, this particular portion of the game. Yes, he is related to Carlo Gambino. They are cousins. Because I know people are going to wonder that. Uh, they came from the Paso de Regano neighborhood in Palermo, which was a mob infested area, uh, which also included the Inzarellos, uh, the Inzarello clan. They were also cousins of the Gambinos uh, and Carlo Gambino. By most accounts, John Gambino got his early entrance into the mafia in Sicily uh, and was, like I said, a cousin of Carlo Gambino. Uh, John Gambino would arrive in New York City in the 1950s, but in 1958, he gets arrested for a petty crime and gets deported for being an illegal alien. He would return a few months later. He would end up marrying in his cousin, uh, who was also a Gambino, uh, which would naturalize his citizenship, excuse me, his citizenship in 1964. Uh, John's father, uh, Tommaso Gambino, was first cousins to Carlo Gambino, which would make Carlo Gambino his second cousin. Uh, and Tommaso Gambino arrives in 1964 and settles in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Uh, there are some that uh, argue that, that John was a made man in Sicily uh, and was a part of the Inzerillo, Gambino, Spatola, Di, Di DiMaggio, uh, Castellano, Mafia clan. 
uh, along with his brothers Joe and Rosario prior prior to his arrival in New York City. Uh, and I would tend to agree with that uh, with that assertion. I, I, they, I think they were made before they came over here. Uh, and the rest would sort of be history. So Gambino would work his way up the mob ladder uh, as his business was the drug business. Let's just be frank about it. Uh, he would officially be made into the Gambino crime family in 1976 when the books reopened. However, in 1972, his parents and sisters would end up moving to New Jersey, which is sort of how there's been this misconception that Carlo Gambino put uh, the Gambinos in New Jersey, and that's not the case. Uh, his his parents and his sisters and his brothers ended up moving to New Jersey. Uh, Gambino sees it as an opportunity to expand his business, which is exactly what he does. Uh, the one thing that we have to discuss is the drug rackets, and here is why. There seems to be, like I said earlier, there was a disconnect between uh, Carlo Gambino's edict of no drug selling. Uh, I think we can honestly objectively say that Gambino allowed drugs to be sold, but I don't think it was nearly as prolific as it would become under the watch of Paul Castellano and John Gotti. Let's just be honest. Uh, in fact, you'd probably be hard pressed to really drill down and find oil. Uh, prior to Gambino's death. But the truth is, you know, they were moving junk in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, and, and Gambino knew what was going on, uh, but I don't think it was anywhere near the scale that it becomes under Castellano and Gotti, like I just said. Uh, Rosario and Joe Gambino were operating in Cherry Hill while John stayed behind in Brooklyn. Uh, Gambino allowed them to operate in New Jersey and align them with Angelo Bruno, who would end up taking kickbacks from the Gambinos in the drug rackets. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into the whole entire bio of the Cherry Hill Gambinos, because honestly, we would be here for a fucking month. Uh, but more or less, th there's a few points that we do need to make. Uh, Joe and Rosario were front men for John in New Jersey and in Philadelphia. They would use funds from John to open up businesses in New Jersey and throughout Delaware, Maryland, Philadelphia, specifically pizza places. Uh, over the years, people have speculated they were deeply rooted into the pizza connection. Uh, but from what I've heard and what I've been able to sort of figure out, uh, they might have been loosely involved in that. Uh, and they, they, they knew probably all the players. Uh, but they didn't get caught up in the Pizza Connection case. They were actually caught up in a thing called the Sicilian case, which was very similar to that. Uh, but they're very widely considered to be the people who invented the scheme and taught others how to use uh, deliveries for tomatoes and whatever the case may be to funnel drugs. And that pizza parlors were the best places places to sort of money launder. Uh, and that's where a lot of the, the guys in this country sort of figured out how to do that. Uh, Joe and Rosario Gambino also really couldn't stay out of trouble in New Jersey, and, and they created a lot of headaches for John throughout the years. Uh, if you want to read more about the Cherry Hill Gambinos, you can uh, do so at your own pace and time. Uh, I just can't get into all of that here. Uh, John was a businessman at heart. Uh, you know, not only was he the link between Sicilian groups, but he was also the way station for narcotics from Italy into the United States. Very similar to what Frank Cali would become. Uh, Frank Cali was also a cousin of John Gambino through the Inzarillos. So, well, actually, Frank Cali married into the into the uh, Inzarillo crime family. So everybody, so Frank Cali would have been related to John Gambino by marriage. So there you go. There, there's we're going to talk a little bit about Frank Cali, but but really not much. Um, so John was into the traditional rackets, which included loan shark and gambling, extortion, construction, and narcotics, and he would use that money to open up some 250 pizza parlors, which, according to the government, okay, he was pulling in $200 million a year legitimately on his own just through pizza parlors. I want to state that again because that's a fucking big thing. He owned 250 pizza places. He was making $200 million a year. Just and that's legitimate money, legitimate money just to those pizza parlors. Now, this is what 1970s do the math. Two hundred million dollars in 1970. What? One 1970. Huge fucking money. Uh, do I believe that's the number? Nah, I don't think so. But if you take, you know, if you take 250 pizza parlors, that means he's making like, what, eight hundred thousand dollars a year, eight hundred eighty thousand dollars a year, whatever the case may be. I don't think it was that high. I, I think legitimately I could see him making half a million dollars. So we'll reduce that 300,000 times 250, you know, probably closer to like $140 million, $150 million. I think that's more realistic. But in 1971, he ends up buying a cattle breeding station in the state of Barinas, Venezuela. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that he was listed on the board of directors for many of the corporations in Venezuela. Uh, through his association with the Contrera brothers. Uh, the Contreras are a mafia clan based in Sicily called the Contrera Caruna Mafia clan. Uh, they were a huge crime family based in Italy, which 
really the, the, the crux of their business was narcotics distribution uh, and had a base of operations in Italy and Montreal uh, and uh, right on the border in Canada. Uh, the Contrera Caruna clan uh, almost certainly was involved in heroin trafficking networks going all the way back to the 1950s. Uh, their name appeared in investigations in famous cases as the French Connection, uh, the Pizza Connection, uh, several several intertwining Sicilian networks were running heroin, you know, into the United States. And that's what the, the French Connection and the Pizza Connection was. Uh, and they all had the same source. They had suppliers from Corsican from Corsica uh, and even in Marseille, France. Uh, and they had high quality laboratories, uh, you know, the, and, and it all went to the same place, North American consumer market. Uh, and that was another link for John to get into the drug market. Uh, in 1972, John formed the Father and Sons Pizza Corporation in Pennsylvania and opened three shops in Philadelphia with his brothers and his father. Joe and Rosario would later up later open up additional pizza places and restaurants throughout North, South Jersey and Philadelphia areas. Uh, and all it was was a front to move money around. Uh, in the middle of 1975, he formed the G&G Concrete Company uh, based in Brooklyn with Anthony Genovese. And those profits would be split between the Genovese crime family and the Gambino crime family. And it also allowed Gambino to move back and forth uh, inside of New Jersey without a lot of problems, as, you know, the Gambinos had business interests with the Genovese controlled areas in New Jersey. Uh, and the fact that, that he owned the G&G Concrete Company meant that he could get involved and did get involved in the Concrete Club. Uh, in June of 1976, Joe Gambino uh, who was John's brother, inquired about a vacant property on Haddonfield Road across from the Garden State Parkway tra uh, racetrack uh, in Cherry Hill. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to transform, and I'm going to get to the point of why this is important. He wanted to transform the former steak and brew into a restaurant and a nightclub called Valentino's Supper Club. Uh, but he couldn't open anything without, you know, John giving him money and without the okay of Angelo Bruno. Uh, and so with Gambino at the t at, at this uh particular property meeting uh, was a guy by the name of Augustine Guzzi Gibbons, uh, Mazio, who at the time was a capo in the Bruin, Bruno crime family. So he had connections within Philadelphia to get this done. Now, the cost would come in at around $600,000 in 1976. It was a fuckload of money. Uh, but the problem was that Joe Rosario uh, couldn't facilitate all of that money on his own. So, you know, John Gambino's front company called the Father and Pizza Sun Corp funnel 50 grand to him. Uh, then they used bank loans to to acquire another forty thousand dollars from a bank. Raymond Long, John uh, Mortarano would also help, donating ten thousand dollars through his vending machine business, uh, which was called John's Wholesale Distributors, which came via Angelo Bruno. Uh, so as you can see, uh, and also it's worth noting, Mortarano was a huge meth dealer, uh, and and he had kept Angelo Bruno on his books as a commission salesman throughout the years. So he's going to open up a, a a business, and he's using mob money and permission from Philadelphia to do so. So in November of 1976, I think it was like November 2nd or 3rd, uh, New Jersey voters approve a referendum to legalize gambling, but limited it to the boardwalk of Atlantic City. A few days later, as Valentino's was preparing to open, Paul Castellano and Angelo Bruno meet. Uh, first of all, they're, they're going there because they want to see the new club, uh, but there were other issues that they needed to talk about. Uh, you know, uh, Castellano goes because he wants to sit down with Angelo Bruno, uh, because he wants to know if Bruno is going to step aside to let the Gambino stake a claim into Atlantic City. Uh, Bruno obviously lets Castellano know through Joe and Rosario Gambino that, yeah, he, he can encroach in Atlantic City. That's not a problem. He can get a kickback from that. But that ends up infuriating uh, guys in the Philadelphia Mafia. And that sort of begins the revolt in Philadelphia and why Bruno was going to have some problems. It wasn't just his greed, uh, but it was his fawning over the Gambino crime family, his stance on accepting drug profits and not allowing uh, his own men to sell them. It was it infuriated the guys because they were allowing the Gambinos to come in and encroach on their territory. And that was a big fucking problem. And guys felt that he was giving way too much to the Gambinos without considering their own family. And that's where Bruno's problems really began. Uh, John, John Gambino with his sources in Italy, uh, the narcotics racket begins to pick up full steam after the death of Carlo Gambino in, I believe, 1976. Uh, but we have to understand the logistics of Italy and the narcotics trafficking to get further sort of down the road into the story. We have to talk about the Second Mafia War because it would infect, uh, it would in effect uh, and would affect 
not just the Inzarellos who are deeply connected with the Gambino and the Gam- with John Gambino and the Gambino crime family, but it would also lead to a ton of murders and the Gambino crime family stepping in to not just save John Gambino, but the Inzarello crime family as well. Uh, the main instigators of this war were the, the Corleone gangsters. Uh, the, the Corleonesi Mafia was a faction within the Corleone family of the Sicilian Mafia that formed in the 1970s. Notable, notable leaders would have been Luciano Leggio, uh, Salvatore Totorina, uh, Leo Luca Bagarella, and Bernardo Provenzano. Uh, the Corleone affiliates uh, were, were not restricted just to the Mafia of Sicily. Uh, the Coriolanesi clan, what they really opposed the faction of people from Palermo. They resented it. Among among others, uh, Gaetano Bonalamente, Stefano uh, Bontate, and Salvatore Zarello. There was a beef between them. Uh, the Sicilian Mafia Commission was reformed about 1970-71 with uh, Bontide and Bonalamente making up two of the three leaders of the new commission. The third was uh, Luciano Leggio. Uh, although at the time he was represented by Toto Rina as Legio was hiding in uh, hiding from the re- murder charges and everything else on the Italian mainland. So when Legio gets captured in 1974 and he gets imprisoned for murder, Toto Rina soon begins to take over boss of the Corleone mafia with Bernardo Provenzano. Uh, and, and just so we understand how that kind of went down. So John Gambino had close ties with Stefano Bontate and the Anzarellos, Salvatore Anzarello specifically, uh, who was the point of contact within Italy for the movement of morphine from Turkey to Italy uh, and then to the U.S. Uh, Anzarello ends up having, Sal- this is how Salvatore Anzarello we're talking about, ends up having the prosecuting judge in a case uh, by the name of uh, Gaetano Costa, who ended up signing a 53, 53 arrest warrants against the Spatola, Inzarello, Gambino, and Castellano clan. Uh, and basically what that did was fucked up their heroin trafficking network. Inzarello was pissed, so he has him killed. And the problem is, is Inzarello does this without asking permission from the Mafia Commission. Uh, you know, and that's a big problem. But the reason why he did it was to prove that he didn't need anybody's permission. He could just do whatever the fuck he wanted. Uh, then on May 11th of 1981, Inzarello gets fucking popped uh, in Palermo as he's, uh, you know, heading towards his recently acquired bulletproof car, uh, leaving the house of his girlfriend. The murder was ordered by Toto Rina for a twofold reason. Toto Rina saw everything as an opportunity and he began killing everybody in an effort to take over control of the Sicilian mafia. That's what he wanted. Then he kills uh, Stefano Bontide. Uh, in April 23rd of 1981, uh, Bontide uh, was machine gunned to death a few weeks later. Uh, you know, Toto Arena has seen enough, and he kills, uh, I think on May 11th, he, he kills Inzarello in a hail of bullets. Uh, various relatives and associates of that pair were subsequently killed or vanished without trace, including Inzarello's 15-year-old son, who was killed for vowing to avenge his father's murder. That's the kid that Toto Rina had his fucking head cut off. Uh, on September 29th of that same year, uh, Colodro Pizzuto, who was another close ally of Bontai and Inzarello, was shot dead in a crowded bar alongside two innocent bystanders. Bottolamente only survived all of this because he fled uh, to Sicily uh, after the Corleone crime family had him expelled in the, in the 1970s. So... Toto Rina wants to take over by any means necessary, but he vows to kill the whole entire Inzarello clan. He's going to kill every women, children, goats, dogs, monkeys, dildos, whatever the fuck it is, he's going to kill them. Uh, it's not just a power grab. Uh, he was furious because the Inzarellos he knew were moving uh, narcotics to the United States, and they refused to share profits with him, and he was pissed. Uh, at the time this is going on, Paul Castellano uh, didn't want to be put in the middle of a Sicilian war. And he calls John Gambino down and he Gambino sits with him and, and a couple other people. Uh, and Paul Castellano wants John Gambino to go sit down with Toto Rina. And he really wants to do this because he doesn't want to get involved with war because they had a captain in the crime family by the name of Nino Inzarello. And they figured that if this war was going to continue to go on, chances are the Gambinos might get dragged into it. Paul Castellano wanted nothing to do with it. So he asked John Gambino to go to Italy and sit down with Toto Rina just in an attempt 
uh, not just to help their own crime family, but he wanted the Inzerillos left alone. Uh, and not just because they were cousins, but like I said, it's because they're worried that one of their captains, Nino Inzarello, who was a captain of the Sicilian crew in New York at the time, would be killed. They just didn't want any retribution. Uh, so John Gambino goes over. Toto Rina agrees to leave them alone, but only if they left Italy and never fucking came back. And if they did, he would kill every single one of them. Uh, Reno was able to make his point very firm by having a couple of more Inzarellos killed in New Jersey and New York. However, one murder that has always been attributed to Toto Rina really had nothing to do with him. It was a murder ordered by Paul Castellano, and the person that Paul Castellano has murdered is Nino Inzarello. Uh, so Nino Inzarello has a few problems. For starter, he's a captain in the Gambinos, right? So he's a cousin. Uh, but he was also at the same time he was a captain in New York of the Sicilian crew. He was helping wage the war over in Italy. And the fear is, is that Toto Reno would react and come after the whole entire Gambino crime family. And Castellano didn't want any spillover. Uh, you know, uh, Reno would send word to the Gambino crime family asking if the Gambinos planned on still supporting Nino Inzarello after everything was going uh, going on. Castellano, you know, probably rightfully so, gets very fucking nervous about the whole thing. And he calls John Gambino and he says, look, this is the problem. Reno's asking us this. What do you want to do? Uh, he talks openly with Gambino about the drama that could be created if, if they don't do something uh, maybe about the perspective loss of drug profits the politics of all of it uh, and I think on Castellano's behalf he didn't want to he didn't want to have a war with Toto Rina uh, that would have been very bad uh, you know and he didn't want the money that they had coming in like I said earlier from narcotics to be cut off so something has to give uh, for Gambino's part he explained to Paul that that it, it would create real problems for the Gambino crime family and that Paul would then order the death of Nino Inzarello. Gambino was tasked with setting up Inzarello for death. Uh, the, the shooters allegedly, at least according to, to the FBI, was Joe Watts and Frankie DeChico uh, and others. After Inzarello's death and with Reno satisfied in promising to leave the Inzarellos alone, Gambino would then gets transferred uh, to Jimmy Brown Falia's crew. Uh, and the Inzarello crew was pretty much shelved by Castellano because he didn't want no more problems. But Castellano's next move was to name Tommy Bellotti a captain, uh, and then he would head what was left of Inzarello's crew. Then he would actually transfer John Gambino to Tommy Bellotti's crew. Uh, so around the time that this is going on, uh, there's a guy by the name of Michael Sindona who has a lot of problems. Uh, Michael Sindona was the chief financial officer for the Gambino's uh, basically laundering drug profits and, and et cetera, et cetera. Sindona was also represented by popes uh, in the Vatican. Uh, Sindona, his whole entire life was a front who was able to funny, funnel money from Italy into the Swiss bank accounts for everybody. In 1972, Sindona purchases a controlling interest in, the, in Long Island's Franklin National Bank from Lawrence Tisch. Uh, he gets hailed as the savior of the lira and was named man of the year uh, and then in 74, he's named by named U.S. ambassador to Italy uh, by John Volpe. Uh, but in April, a sudden start, stock market crash led to what is known as the Il Crack Sindona. Uh, the Franklin Bank's profit fell by 98 percent compared to the previous year. And Sindona suffered a 40 million dollar loss. He begins losing most of the banks that he acquired over the previous 20 years. On October 8th in 1974, the bank was declared insolvent due to mismanagement and fraud uh, involving losses in foreign currency and, and speculation for poor, horrible, uh, poor loan uh, policies. Uh, a part of these losses uh, involved Sindona's transfer of $30 million to, the, to bank funds of Europe to recover his losses. Uh, Sindona then laundered the proceeds of heroin tra tra trafficking, uh, for the Bon Tide, Spatola, Inzarello, Castellano, Gambino network. Uh, the mob, you know, pretty much at this point uh, is fed up with Sindona. Uh, they were determined to get their money back uh, and and they would try to help Sindona. But but ultimately, because, you know, Sindona had buried money and moved money around for the mob for a long time uh, and they wanted to keep it going. Uh, so in July 11th of 1979, Giorgio Ambrosoli who was the lawyer who was commissioned as liquidator of Sindona's banks, ends up getting murdered in Milan. Uh, Milan councilman Antonio Amati turned the case over to a young judge, Giuliano Tyrone, 
Uh, and it gets discovered that Michael Sindona ordered Ambrosoli's murder, which was carried out by an American mob guy, which was sent to Italy on behalf of the Gambino crime family. It was simply a way of them to rid themselves of a problem. And and ultimately, that, that hit on Giorgio Ambrosoli would come back to haunt Sindona. But at the same time, uh, the mob killed Boris Giuliano in Palermo, uh, and he was the guy who was investigating the mafia's heroin trafficking ring, and he ended up contacting Amber Soli just two weeks before that to sort of compare notes on the investigation. So here we see that the, the mob in, in Italy is trying to control the investigation. Uh, Sindona had a major fucking problem because there were indictments in New York and in Italy, uh, and John Gambino stepped up to help. Uh, Gambino and Sindona were very good friends. Uh, and it is believed that Sindona came to New York to talk to, to John Gambino about what, what Gambino could do to help him. Uh, and, and so what ends up happening is Gambino gets him passports. Uh, so essentially he can fake a kidnapping for an 11 week attempt to recover some of the mob's money. So Gambino says, okay, you're under indictment in New York. I'm going to get you a a fucking fake passport. We're going to act like this was a kidnapping and you have 11 weeks to get our fucking money back. And that's essentially, uh, what it came down to, uh, to fix his fucking house, to repair his house, get the fucking money. So in August of 1979, as the plan is hatched, Sindona ends up dis- disappearing. Uh, like I said, the real purpose of the kidnapping was to pass blackmail. Well, I didn't say this before, but the real purpose of the kidnapping was to pass blackmail notes to Sindona's past political allies, among them Prime Minister uh, Giulio Andrade, uh, to engineer the rescue of his banks and to recover Cosa Nostra's money. So what he was doing was trying to, to take all of his political allies that he ever had and blackmail them. I'll say this about you. I'll say this. Unless you step in and put a stop to all this shit that's going on with the banks because I need to get these guys their money back or they're going to fucking kill me. And that's where, you know, his back was totally up against the wall. Uh, The plot didn't work, and ultimately he gets convicted in 1980 in the United States on 65 counts, including fraud, perjury, false bank statements, uh, misappropriation of bank funds. Uh, At the time, he was represented by one of the nation's leading attorneys, who was Ian Fisher, or excuse me, Ivan Fisher. You can look up information about him. So while Sindona is serving time in a U.S. federal prison, the Italian government applies for his extradition back to Italy to stand trial for murder. Uh, He ends up getting sentenced to 25 years in an Italian prison on March 27th of 84. On March 18th of 86, he was poisoned with cyanide in his coffee in his cell at the prison at Voghera while waiting while, excuse me, while serving a life sentence for the murder of Giorgio Ambrosoli. Uh, the mob had had enough, and they took care of business, uh, but ultimately they never got their money, and that's why Sindona was killed. Had nothing to do with you know, him getting arrested. It had to do with, well, maybe it had a little bit to do with him being sloppy, but ultimately they lost a fucking ton of money, and they were pissed, so they had him killed. Uh, it's been alleged that during the time that Sindona was actively moving money, uh, that they, that John Gambino was pulling in six hundred million dollars a year, which was split between Spatola, Gambino, Inzarella, and the Castellano Narcotics, uh, I guess, corporation. If you want to call it that, it's a lot of fucking money. A lot of fucking money, uh, especially uh, you know in the year. So in 1982, Judge Giovanni Falcone in one in a one thousand page indictment charged Gambino along with 75 others for being involved in a heroin smuggling ring, which Falcone claimed was a $560 million a year business uh, with money laundered, then reinvested in real estate in Italy. So not only did the mob take all that money, but they were reinvesting in Italy. And we see that now, especially within Drangheta and the Sicilian mob are still doing that in Italy, especially during the pandemic. They had, uh, Properties that have been seized in Italy are now have been bought back by the mob. Uh, U.S. authorities refused to extradite John Gambino to Italy, who technically was a U.S. citizen as of 1964, uh, and he gets convicted in absentia, which means he wasn't there. They convicted him anyway, uh, and at a later date was sentenced to seven years in prison. Uh, As long as he stayed out of Italy, he's never going to have another problem, uh, but but this conviction would later come back to haunt him a little bit. So in 1985, after Paul Castellano gets whacked along with Tommy Bellotti, 
John Gambino is promoted to captain of Bilotti's former crew by John Gotti and takes over command of the Sicilian faction of the Gambino crime family. Not only did Gambino make millions from drugs, but he had an active part in the country concrete club as well, not to mention legal funds from all the legit businesses that he owned. He diversified. Uh, Gotti needed somebody to command the Sicilian wing, and he needed to keep the money from narcotics flowing, and Gambino was his man in charge. Uh, in 1985, Gambino would suffer a stroke, uh, and many think it was probably the stress from his brothers because they were getting indicted left and right in Philadelphia and in New Jersey, constantly like having to go before Senate committee hearings, constantly under investigation. And a lot of people thought that it was the stress of all of that that caused the stroke uh, of John Gambino. But he would survive the stroke. But at the same time, his brother Joe and Rosario could not stay out of fucking trouble on december 1st of 1988 italian and u.s law enforcement cracked down on the gambino and zarello network again with an operation called operation iron tower italian and federal uh, italian and federal prosecutors indicted 200 defendants in italy uh, and the united states on drug trafficking charges among the arrestees was joe gambino uh, John Gambino was arrested but not charged. Uh, the FBI could not gather enough evidence against John Gambino, but it was described in a court affidavit. Uh, he was described in a court affidavit as the leader of the Brooklyn-based Sicilian faction of the Gambino crime family. Uh, trouble would continue to mount. Uh, the brothers would be released, and after their initial indictments in 88 and in 89, uh, John, Gambo, John Gambino would be arrested again on January 4th of 1989. 90. Uh, he was later charged in a superseding indictment with narcotics and racketeering violations. On January 5th of 1990, he was released on $2 million personal recognizance bond, which was signed by his wife and his son. Uh, the government at this point is hell-bent on getting Gambino at any cost, and they just kept adding charges every other day. Uh, they would use rats for information, and then they would end up indicting both Joe Gambino and John Gambino on murder charges uh, dating back to 1981, and those charges were facilitated by Sammy DeBull Gravano. Uh, John would have multiple medical issues, and he would try to get his case severed from his brothers, which is what a lot of gangsters do. Uh, but the government and the judge overseeing the case refused to budge, and Joe and John were starting to believe that they were going to get fucked by the government. Between Sammy the Bull Gravano uh, and the government, they start to see they're not going to they're not going to get a fair shake. They end up having GPS bracelets, you know, ankle monitors put on them. Uh, and then somehow they get their lawyer to argue with the judge to remove the GPS locators. They've given two, two million, five million dollars is PR bond. Uh, they don't need the fucking locators. Uh, John's got health issues. They're not going to take off. But that's exactly what they needed. And they end up taking off and fleeing to Florida. So in September of 1992, I believe it was September 1st, uh, Joe and John Gambino were supposed to show up in court for an arraignment hearing and they don't show up. Uh, they decided to hold up down in Florida, secluded by the South Haven Hotel and apartments in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which is a city that John had gone to many times for vacation. Uh, an unidentified hotel clerk saw, uh, told the newspapers that the brothers had been staying in another hotel nearby, but they switched because they wanted a cleaner place. So the whole time they're trying to hide, people are still giving them up. She added that they registered under different names. Uh, one of them signing in is Tony D'Amato from Sicily. There were others sharing a four-room suite for which they paid cash. Uh, she also told the government that, uh, you know, they like to, to sort of work out by the pool. Uh, but the problem is that exposure is what ultimately leads to the FBI finding them. So after 17 days of being down in Florida, John and Joe get caught and arrested on September 22nd. Authorities were actually uh, searching for what they thought was a man with a limp because one Florida detective had remembered that John walked with a limp uh, because of the because of the stroke that he had. And they used old video evidence of John uh, Gambino meeting with John Gotti in Florida down in the late 80s. I think it was 89. And they, they pulled up that surveillance and realized that he had had a limp. So they were going to look for a guy with a limp. Um, so at one point, John's taking a, a stroll you know, off the hotel grounds when he gets spotted. Uh, even though he had grown a beard, his hair was longer, authorities uh, pretty much knew who they were. Uh, they ended up, uh, a detective ended up following John back to the hotel. He alerts task force members and then they move in and they arrest everybody. Uh, later that night around, uh, I, I think it's like around midnight that night, uh, FBI agents and Broward County detectives clear nearby rooms, knocked on John and Joe's door. 
uh, identifying themselves. Uh, basically, they, they ended up getting caught. Uh, so they had to forfeit their $5 million bond, uh, but it was another charge that they added. It was just another charge that was added to the list of, of things they were facing. Both brothers get extradited back to New York, uh, and they had to sit basically in jail at, at MCC until the trial began the following February. On February 1st of 1993, that trial would begin. Uh, so we need to talk about this, this is this part of it is like what I like to call the rats arrive uh, Sicilian rat Francesco Marino Manoia, uh, who was also called mozzarella for some fucking reason. Uh, he was a chemist uh, who manufactured heroin in a lab in uh, Italy. Uh, he also admitted to com- committing more than 25 murders while he was a member of the Sicilian mafia. Uh, John and Joe's trial was the only time he ever testified in a U.S. case against any defendant. Uh, mozza- we're just going to call him mozzarella. Uh, mozzarella, who admitted, you know, he stole the nativity of St. Francis and St. Lawrence, uh, excuse me, St. Lawrence, which was a painting uh, by Caravaggio, uh, is still missing. He is widely suspected to be the person that stole that. Uh, he gets admitted into WITSEC uh, after being granted American citizenship in exchange for his testimony against the Gambino brothers. Uh, Italy gave him other incentives as well for testifying against alleged Sicilian mafia members there, including payments of $3,000 a month plus money from his father's pension. So once again, we see the Sicilian, or the Italian government, the American government giving rats everything. Uh, he would also receive $600,000 for giving evidence against Italian politician Giulio Andretti, uh, who was alleged to have mafia associations. According to court documents, Mozzarella detailed in his testimony several points showing that John was the man pulling the strings in the big business of drug trafficking between the United States and Italy. Uh, He testified that he personally manufactured the heroin that was being sent to the United States, but more precisely uh, to Giovanni Gambino, who was John Gambino. Uh, He added that the shipments were sent to John on a regular basis, uh, since uh, 1979, after Stefano Bontade had created a partnership between himself and Salvatore Anzarello and John. So he's given the he's connecting the dots for the government. Uh, he also claimed that he personally met with John three different occasions, the last being to show John how the heroin was actually made. After Mozzarella's sordid bullshit rat tail, the government, you know, puts another bum on the stand. Uh, this bum was <laughs> Gaspari Mutolo, who was the former driver and right-hand man of Sicilian mob boss Toto Rina. Uh, while sitting in an Italian prison after his conviction in the Maxi trial, which you can look up for yourself, uh, where he was on the third year of his 16-year sentence, he decides to flip sides. Mutolo had admitted to brutally murdering, murdering more than 30 people, for which he received immunity from the Italian government, therefore allowing him to live free without fear of ever being convicted for his crimes. Uh, Italian authorities were, were hiding him in an attempt to sort of, uh, you know, keep him safe on the Italian countryside. And at some point after the failure of Kane and Zarbano, the U.S. District Attorneys, James Comey, that name ought to be familiar, and Patrick Fitzgerald, they flew to Italy to gather information that he might know about the Gambinos to assist in the trial. He claimed that he had organized a deal for a thousand pound shipment of heroin from Italy to the United States in 1981, and that he handed over 500 pounds personally to John Gambino. Uh, It wasn't only uh, it wasn't the only testimony he had against the elder Gambino brother either. Gaspari Mutolo hiding behind a mask. Uh, you know, he is now allegedly turned to religion and art uh, in an attempt in his mind anyway to make up for his past sins, including his self-admitted admitted murders of some 30 people for which he was never convicted. Uh, in order to, to build credibility for the jurors, Mozzarella and Mutolo... Uh, had to testify about their past, including the admission of of the murders they committed, which between the two of them was over 70 people. Uh, But that revelation didn't seem to sit well with the government's ace in the whole witness, Sammy the Turd Gravano. And this is what's kind of funny to me. Uh, Gravano was also a part of this case. Uh, And Gravano has sort of a temper tantrum like a little bitch that he is because James Comey, who then was the prosecutor in this case, uh, you know, uh, Mutolo and fucking Mozzarella, like serious killers. They had 70 murders. And Gravano thought that it made him look weak, like he wasn't a real gangster because the two other people that they had involved in this case made him look like a pussy in comparison. So that ought to prove to you uh, that Gravano, uh, A, wasn't, you know, he, he might have killed 19 people here, but he was nothing in comparison to these two pricks. 
Uh, and he didn't like the fact that, that Comey was sort of bringing them out to be really hardcore killers and real gangsters because Gravano's ego wouldn't allow it. Uh, in 1993, Gravano ends up detailing the events of the Francesco Oliveri murder of 1981. And that's what the government really needed. They needed a fucking murder. The narcotics thing would put them away for 30 years. But they needed a fucking murder charge. And of course, you know, the turd Gravano is going to give it to him. Uh, he ends up testifying that John had gotten permission from John Gotti to kill Oliveri in a revenge for him killing another member of John's crew. Gravano claimed that John Gotti told me to go on this hit, supervise it, get it done. He testified that his role was a backup shooter as well as a supervisor of the hit. I don't believe any of that. I think that's a fucking lie. Uh, his team included Joe Gambino and three others, one of which was an associate who was going to be the shooter as a test before becoming a made man. The hit team then gathered surveillance and needed materials, including guns, masks, getaway cars, uh, and set the date to take out Oliveri. Uh, they had decided to kill him in the morning when he left his house to move his car, a routine that he performed daily. The day before the murder, Joe reportedly met with Sammy de Bull Gravano to finalize the deal. Uh, and the government even showed jury surveillance footage of Joe entering a social club where Gravano was allegedly waiting for him inside. Uh, on the day of the planned hit, the team showed up late to Oliveri's home and discovered that Oliveri had already moved his car before they got there. The following week, the team tried again. This time, they solved the problem. Uh, not to be outdone by the lies of Gravano, uh, Gambino would actually turn to an informant, not turn into, but he would turn to an informant uh, in another case to try to prove that Gra Gravano was a lying sack of piss. In 1993, John and Joe's defense attorney attorneys would call Tommaso Buscetta as a witness on their behalf. Tommaso Buscetta, you can look that up for yourself, notorious rat. Uh, but Buscetta had been a close friend of the Gambino's brother's father back in Italy. So Tommaso Gambino and Tommaso Buscetta were a very close friend. And, uh, and it was also the first time that Buscetta had ever been in New York since his testimony in the Pizza Connection, which was back in the late 80s. Uh, so even though Buscetta's testimony you know, help convict 300 men in Italy in the infamous Maxi trial case and 18 men in the pizza connection case in the United States. Prosecutor Patrick Fitzgerald tries to discredit Buscetta by telling the jury that he had received immunity after admitting the role in three crimes. Meanwhile, Gravano committed 19 fucking murders. Mozzarella Mutola had fucking uh, committed 70 fucking murders. So this is a case of the government saying, well, damned if you do, damned if you don't. It's funny to me how... Gravano, uh, Mutolo, and fucking Mozzarella could have, what, 90 murders between the three or whatever the fucking case may be. Uh, actually, it would have been 89 murders between the three of them. And it's okay that their witness is in a fucking case against John and Joe Gambino, but God forbid that Tommaso Buscetta, who, uh, you know, committed murders himself uh, and who had immunity agreements, same as fucking Gravano and the rest of them. It's, it's a hypocrite thing f to fucking do. It's a hypocrite, you know... Uh, Patrick Fitzgerald saying, oh, well, he got, a, you know, immunity after committing his crimes. But but Gravano, uh, Mutola, and Mozzarella did the same fucking thing. So how is it good for two or three others, but not for one? It's bullshit. That's the way the government works. Uh, so it, it's it, the it, and the agreement that Mozzarella and Minoya had was the same fucking immunity agreement in, uh, that Gravano had and the same ones that Buschetta had. So you can't say that one over supersedes the other. So on June 5th of 1993, after a four-month trial, the jury had reached its decision. The jury was hung 11-1 on charges, except for one. They found that John and Joe were guilty of bail jumping, uh, but due to a previous agreement, uh, the brothers would not receive a sentence for that conviction. They basically threw it. Uh, Comey thought that Gambinos had paid off a juror, but couldn't prove it as well. Uh, the government would retry the case, and then on November of 1993, they would face an additional nine other counts of indictments. Uh, and the Gambinos sort of begin to see the writing on the wall, and they ended up pleading out to a murder, conspiracy to murder, drug traffic, and racketeering, and they end up getting sentenced to 15 years without parole. Uh, and, and so, listen, it's the lesser of two evils. Uh, you know, they end up getting a mistrial in one case. They end up, you know, dr the only thing that they, you know, get, uh, the only thing that they're really guilty of is jump bail jumping at that point. But the government, once again, goes back at them. Uh, they're able to get that murder charge to stick. They've got nothing there. I mean, listen, how many other people, you know, get get convicted of murder, conspiracy to murder, drug traffic and racketeering and only get, excuse me, only get 15 years. It's a, it's a good deal for them. Uh, so in October of 2005, a few days before John was to be released from Fort Devens, 
uh, which is in Mass, uh, federal prison, where he was serving the last days of his... He was almost out of fucking prison. Almost out of fucking prison. He ends up getting rearrested by the U.S. authorities. Italian authorities had requested that John be extradited to Italy for that conviction. Because so for the in absentia conviction, the Italian authorities are like, no, nope, fuck this. We want to bring him back. Uh, so there's an initial hearing on the matter. And he was taken to the mass correctional institution in Plymouth, where he would remain for another 17 months till they could figure out what they were going to do. Uh, the U.S. district judge in that case, Reginald Lindsay overturned Bauer's ruling because John had already served a 15 year sentence in the United States and that he shouldn't be jailed again for the same fucking charges over in Italy. Uh, and so all that being said, the charges get thrown out and, and he's going to be able to be released from prison. Uh, it's been alleged that in 2008, he was a member of a three man ruling panel to oversee the Gambino crime family after the arrest and convictions of the alleged heads of the Gambino crime family in uh, the FBI's operation, which was called Operation Old Bridge, uh, you know, uh, so Gambino gets out, goes back to work a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of eyes are on uh, the, the narcotics trafficking. Uh, and, and Gambino was a very sick guy. He had a lot of physical ailments. Uh, and while he was in prison, he suffers a bunch of heart attacks and a couple more strokes. And when he comes out, it, you know, he really doesn't come out the same guy and, and, and everything begins to slow down. And then in uh, 2017. He ends up passing away of, you know, uh, ramifications of just health problems in general and who steps right into his role, but his nephew, Frank Kelly. So there you go. Uh, that's that. And then what does Frank Kelly do? Frank Kelly's married into the Injurello crime family and they just begin to recycle it again and do it again. And so that's sort of the story of John Gambino. And, and, and you have to think about things logistically for just like one second here. Uh, Gambino you know, was a very powerful guy for not being a captain. He was the bridge that gapped all of organized crime, at least from a narcotics distribution point uh, between Italy and the United States. If he's making 200, let's say, let's let's reduce the 200 million legitimately from pizza parlors. Let's take it to 100 million, even 100 million on your own from legitimate businesses is a ton of fucking money. And I've got to imagine, and, and you know, they, they, I think there was a Time Magazine article for, from like, what, fucking 1987, 1988, where they talked about the, the 10 wealthiest gangsters, and by far the wealthiest was, was Tony Salerno at the top. Uh, but I, I'm beginning to think I, don't think, I don't think John Gambino had Tony Salerno money, but I think he was pretty fucking close. Uh, that's just not an everyday thing that you see. You don't normally typically see a guy who's not a captain of a crew being responsible for a huge narcotics networking. It's just some things you don't see. And, and I think that, you know, when Gotti promotes him in 1986 uh, is very telling, very telling. Uh, and, and so the idea that the Gambinos didn't sell drugs is bullshit. They did. Everybody knows that. Uh, under Gambino, I'm sure, you know, so the question's going to be, somebody's going to invariably ask me, you know, if if Gambino realizes they're selling drugs, is, is it the high volume that it was? I don't I think it was it was big, but I think it was minor in terms of what Castellano would turn a blind eye to. Uh, and that's the hypocrisy that I that I wanted to talk about for one second before we get out of here, uh, because it, it, and listen, I'm not uh, I'm coming to the defense of John Gotti for a second, because a lot of people talk all this crazy shit about, well, you know, he went against the fucking rules. You know, he knew Angelo Ruggiero and, and Jeannie Gotti and we're all selling narcotics, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, it, he should have been held accountable for his crew doing something against the rules. What was against the fucking rules? The rule may be don't sell drugs, but what it really means is don't fucking get caught selling drugs. They weren't against the profits of narcotics. They just knew there would be a ton of time they would get if they get caught. Paul Castellano knew what was going on. Carlo Gambino knew what was going on. Carlo Gambino was at the fucking commission meeting where fucking, uh, you know, Carmine Galante and Joe Bonanno were, and, and even back in the days of Lucky Luciano were trying to set up the drug trafficking networks where the drugs would come from, where, where they would go. So to say that they didn't know that is bullshit. They knew that. Uh, and so for, for anybody to say, because I see it said in a lot of fucking groups, well, John, how do you? He knew they were selling drugs, should have killed them, blah, blah, blah. Difference is John Gotti got caught doing it, okay? And that's the only reason why there was ever a beef about it. Uh, that's all the only reason why Castellano was furious with Angelo Ruggiero is because he got fucking caught. That was the problem. They had no problem taking profits from that. So if the rule is don't sell it, then why are they taking profits from it? The whole profit of drugs in Cherry Hill, and, and, and I'll move to that for a second. Imagine you're Angelo Bruno, you're the boss of Philadelphia, 
You're telling your own guys they can't sell fucking drugs. You look 20 minutes up the fucking road, you got Gambino, Gambino representatives selling fucking drugs. You know, you got the boss of your bar guy to meet in Paul Castellano. And, Paul, and he's going to give Paul Castellano a cut of Atlantic City, which rightfully should be owned by the Philadelphia Mafia, the Bruno crime family, whatever you want to call them. So he's going to tell guys, you can't earn this way, but I'm going to let the Gambinos do it. So he's funneling and loading his fucking pockets up and then telling his own guys to starve. That's what ultimately leads to Bruno having the problems that he had. You know, you, you could be the docile Don, the quiet Don all day long. But if you tell guys they can't earn and then you're going to let a representative from another crime family do what he fucking wants in your turf, in your territory, that's a problem. You know, so the idea that, that, that people didn't know that, that drugs were being sold by everybody. It's nothing new. You can't you can't make the argument with me that, oh, drugs were banned when they all went to a fucking meeting to discuss how the, the, the fucking networking, how they were going to be the. De- de- you know, distributed the the networking as far as where to move them from Corsica to Marseille to the fucking New York. And so that that argument, when people bring that up about Gotti, I, I just can't I can't get down with because it doesn't make any fucking sense to me. So John Gambino was a guy who came over to the country, had some serious, serious fucking affiliations was able to keep that network going, was able to stop Toto Arena from killing a shitload of people. He was Castellano's go-to guy to help fix that. This was a guy who was a made guy, but not a captain at the time. He sent a soldier, a typically a soldier, to Italy to handle it. That ought to tell you the respect and in, in the in the the the, the fucking non fear they had with John Gambino about being a stand up guy. Now, had his brothers uh, had Joe and Rosario been able to stay the fuck off the radar, then I don't really think that that necessarily the government is watching John Gambino as much as they are. But this is a guy that took a lot of money from illegitimate businesses, formed legitimate businesses, and made a killing. I don't know how much this guy, how much money this guy was worth, but you just do the math on two hundred million dollars from legitimate shit, legitimate shit, opening pizza places, just that alone. Then you add the the narcotics trafficking to it. Then you then you add the the construction companies. You know, and sure, he's going to kick up his ten to twelve percent. You guys can do the math. That's an insane amount of fucking money. An insane amount of money. And he was a tough guy, too. He didn't hesitate. Not many guys are able to go from New York right into New Jersey and not have a fucking problem. So he was very valuable to the Gambino crime family. Uh, and, and so I I, th- I would be willing to tell you that the bulk of the Gambino crime family's money back in those days in the late 70s, early 80s was narcotics and concrete. Narcotics and construction. Uh, and so maybe the numbers that the federal government has put out throughout the years about, you know, under Gotti regime, it was $800 million a year. I, I have no problem believing that. I think that's really close to the number, to believe it or not. You know, in totality of everything that they were doing. And so I think that when people discuss high earners, capable guys, a lot of people don't mention John Gambino because I don't think there's a lot of information out there about him. I don't think a lot of people ever considered that guy to be more than, than really just a captain. Uh, but that guy was a mover and a fucking shaker. And if it's not for Sammy Gravano, Mutolo, and a fucking jerk off uh, mozzarella, he probably doesn't go to prison. But he ends up getting out of prison, and it just he was too beat up health wise. But that was a, that guy was boss material all the fucking way, all the fucking way. Uh, and even now today, because somebody will invariably say to me, "Well, what's you know the, the fact that Frank Kelly took over another real relative and did the same fucking thing, if not better." than John Gambino did is saying a lot. That is saying a lot. So that's the life of John Gambino. Hope you enjoyed it. So here's what we're going to do next week. We're going to come back. We are going to do a Q&A and that's it. No biography next week. Next week, you'll be able to figure out everything. I'm going to tell you is everything we're going to do on the new platform uh, from A to Z. Uh, you know, every going to open the books and tell everybody what, what the plan is. So per the usual, thank you for listening. Uh, anybody who has donated to my channel, I really appreciate it. You can donate it. There's a link over on YouTube underneath the video to the PayPal. We appreciate everybody who has taken time, a dollar here, a dollar there. It doesn't matter. We just appreciate everybody that has donated. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the new platform. I'm looking forward to the new adventures. I'm looking forward to having my guests on. I'm looking forward to covering more topics than we've ever covered before. Uh, and that's that. So have a great week, everybody. We will be back next week with the final Q&A 
on the YouTube platform. Take care, and we will see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.